In the countdown to 2030, it is our job to deliver these services. Now we come together again, determined to reach the children at greatest risk, no matter where they are, and get back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. We will discuss better ways to protect the most vulnerable children and make bold new commitments that accelerate progress, ensuring that our time together is a turning point in the long journey to fulfill our promise to every child, a fifth birthday. Welcome to the second global forum on childhood pneumonia. Good morning, everybody, and let me reiterate what was said on the video. Welcome to the second Global Forum on Childhood Pneumonia. So let me start with the practical things before we get to the more exciting things. I hope all of you have remembered to collect your headsets so that you can have translation on the different channels. Please remember and feel free to use social media. There are hashtags that are available to amplify the messages that we're going to be discussing during this forum. And then also I've been asked just to remind everybody to keep an eye and be aware of things that are valuable to you. Madrid is a very, very safe city, but like any city where there is tourism, you just have to be a little careful and make sure that you're not leaving your things scattered around for other people. So, having gotten through the practical things, let me start by really offering to you my very, very deep appreciation for the time and commitment that you have all shown by being here. And it's a time in the cycle of our world that we really do need that level of commitment from each and every one of us. Three years ago, in 2020, ministers of health and many key actors in the fight to ensure child survival gathered at the first Global Forum for Childhood Pneumonia in Barcelona. This included many of your ministers of health, many civil society actors, many donor partners, and even though at that time we could really track progress, we knew that there was still a long way to go. We knew that we, some countries were on track to meet SDG 3.2. Others were getting there, but perhaps a little bit more slowly. And we all knew that there was extra work that we needed to do to reach those children who are most at risk and the children who are hardest to reach in the efforts that we were making. But there was real optimism. And the participants at that forum came together and understood that collaboration was the way in which we could accelerate our efforts. And there were some amazing commitments made. There was great information shared and people left with an agenda. And then COVID hit us. And we all know what COVID has done to some of the progress that we had made. It's not a good thing that we are standing here and actually looking to see that there's the largest continuous black backsliding on childhood vaccination in almost 30 years. We know what the problems are. We know the areas of our work that COVID unraveled. What we do also know is that we have the information we have the technology, we have the people, those of you in this room and those of you in our countries who aren't here, we know what we need to do to accelerate our efforts and ensure that we reduce childhood pneumonia and boost child survival. 
having done this before, it should be easier for us to regenerate. These two days provide all of you with the opportunity to share information, to look at the countries who have managed to stay on track despite incredible challenges, to look at the new ideas coming from countries that have been really adversely affected by all kinds of contextual challenges. We've got government, civil society, private sector, donor community, academia, all of the people that we need to reinvigorate, to rejuvenate, to accelerate our efforts. Please make use of each other. Please make use of the knowledge in this room. You are the people who will go back to your homes, will go back to your offices, will go back to your countries to lead this acceleration. People talk about us having seven years to the 2030 target that was set by the SDGs. I actually think we can't think in terms of seven years. While there are still 600,000 children dying every year from what is a completely preventable disease, we do not have the luxury of thinking in terms of seven years. We need to act now, we need to act urgently, we need to put into practice all of the knowledge that we have gathered over the years, all of the lessons that we've learned about not working in silos. Your being here is part of that rejuvenation. Please make use of the informal spaces as well as the formal discussions. And please know that as your ministers of health three years ago discussed and confirmed, we know that collaboration, that working across sectors, that mixing technical expertise with social context and economic change are all part of our struggle to boost childhood survival. We have two days to enthuse ourselves, to enthuse each other, and to go back home rejuvenated. I look forward to spending those two days with you. Thank you. And now we will have some opening remarks. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage her Royal Highness, the Infanta Cristina of Spain. Good morning to all of you. Buenos dias, bonjour, bon dia. I am really pleased on behalf of La Caixa Foundation as my role of Director of International Area and on behalf of East Global in my role of President of the Board of Trustees to give you a very warm welcome here to Caixa Forum Madrid for the opening of the second global forum on childhood pneumonia. But please allow me to briefly introduce you to both the institutions. La Caixa Foundation was created 119 years ago with the aim of contributing to the progress of people and building a better society for all. Currently, the foundation promotes social and cultural projects, supports scientific innovation and quality education and fosters talent so that we can all improve individually, but above all, as a society. The foundation fosters advances in biomedical research and innovation, supports researchers and clinicians in Spain and Portugal to provide solutions to infectious, oncological, cardiovascular, and neurological diseases. Most of the foundation's activity is currently carried out in Spain and Portugal. But since 1997, 
we started working on international cooperation programs, mainly focused on global health through projects that combat the main diseases that affect poverty, with special emphasis on pneumonia, malaria, and malnutrition. On job creation, capacity building and education, and humanitarian and emergency aid. The goal is to generate opportunities and fight inequalities for the most vulnerable populations in countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, always aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030. We implement these programs in partnership with some of the most and main international organizations, such as the, as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, UNICEF, UNHCR, the Kaluste Gulbenkian Foundation, and the Aga Khan Foundation, among others. As regards is global, it is a consolidated hub of excellence in research, fruit of an innovative alliance between La Caixa Foundation, academic institutions, and government bodies to contribute to the efforts undertaken by the international community to address the challenges in global health in low- and middle-income countries. Its working model is based on the generation of scientific knowledge through research programs and groups, and its translation through the areas of education and training and analysis and global development. As you know, back in January 2020, just a few weeks before the Wuhan pneumonia outbreak spread globally and became a pandemic, we held in Barcelona the first global forum on childhood pneumonia with more than 300 stakeholders committed with a fight against child mortality. Since then, and with an unprecedented pneumonia-associated pandemic, still today, pneumonia is the killer of 700,000 children every year. This is why more commitment, support for the research and innovation, and economic resources are needed to prevent pneumonia cases and deaths. We have to develop the next generation of tools and strategies that will boost pneumonia control efforts. The aim of the second Global Forum is to reflect on what we have managed to achieve in the last three years and keep or make new commitments so that, joining all our efforts and resources, we can drastically reduce the deaths caused by pneumonia. The Kaisha Foundation's main focus is to improve prevention and treatment of the disease. And for the next years, we're going to continue to include the fight against pneumonia as a priority in all the Foundation's international cooperation global health programs, call for proposals, etc., and maintain the support to Gavi in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and this global to prevent pneumonia with vaccination through the Alliance of Child Vaccination. You will have a chance to learn more about the Alliance tomorrow afternoon during the role of the private sector session. But very briefly, this is a very successful program that we launched 15 years ago. In 2008, La Caixa Foundation gave a 4 million euro grant to Gavi, the largest donation from a private sector partner at that time, and also launched the Alliance for Child Vaccination to give La Caixa's customers, employees, and general public the opportunity to contribute. The results are staggering. More than 5,800 companies engaged, over 43 million euros raised, almost 9 million children vaccinated in 10 countries. And why did we do this? Because we all know very well that there is no progress without health, and there is no economic growth without strong health systems. This is why we need to tackle the disease, the diseases that kill the most, and pneumonia is one of them. We are all aware of what we need to do, and we count on many committed partners and governments. So let's make sure every child can survive and thrive. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude once again to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their very generous contribution to make these two forums possible, their relentless support to global health, and for taking us on board to accompany them in the huge challenges we are facing. 
A big thank you to the rest of co-hosts, UNICEF, Every Breath Counts, Save the Children, Gavi, UNITAID, USAID, PATH, Children Health Task Force, and Clinton Health Access Initiative. Thank you for helping us in organizing such a powerful forum with such an amazing and ambitious program. And of course, thank you to all the country delegations and participants, especially the experts and the authorities from so many countries that have made the effort to be here today. I wish you all a very successful and productive second global forum on childhood pneumonia. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muy obrigada. Thank you. And thank you very much to Her Royal Highness for those remarks, but also for your unfailing support for these efforts. And now we welcome to the stage Dr. Keith Klugman of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Her Royal Highness, Infanta Christina, Your Excellencies, thank you so much to La Caixa, thank you too to the Spanish government for hosting us today. Pneumonia is very seldom the focus of our attention. I will tell you that working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you will very rarely see Bill Gates wearing a jacket or a tie. So much so that I didn't even have a jacket to come to this meeting. Uh, so we have a baby child who just turned one, uh, and it was her birthday in New York. And of course, I was wandering around where they live, which is Columbus Circle, so lots of connection with, uh, with Spain. And I have a son-in-law, and I mentioned to him that I have to give this presentation in front of uh, Her Highness and Their Excellencies, and he spends a lot more time thinking about cars and watches and clothes than I do. So he insisted that we go to Hugo Boss and buy this jacket. So thank you all for my new jacket. So I now want to talk obviously about the serious problem of pneumonia. And as was mentioned, um, it's ironic that the world has thought about little else than pneumonia for the last three years. But a pandemic which killed the elderly. And this was a huge problem. The, the best estimates of the number who have died in terms of excess mortality globally is 20 million. And it's not actually the majority in the poorest parts of the world because it's a pathogen which killed the elderly in an exponential fashion. So if you are 70 years old, you had 10 times the risk of death than if you were 60. And if you were 80, 10 times the risk of 70. And the older people in the world actually live in richer parts of the world. So the majority of deaths from this pandemic in the elderly uh, were in fact in middle income countries because the very richest countries of course got vaccines early, got treatment. I was chatting yesterday to colleagues from Mozambique. They still don't have Paxlovid, which is a life-saving drug that will save 80% of people if it's taken early. So we've come through this pandemic that killed the elderly. But the focus of this uh, meeting is on the other group that pneumonia kills. Pneumonia kills old people and pneumonia kills young people. And the young people who die of pneumonia do not die in rich countries. They die in the poorest countries. And that's the first lesson for this meeting. If you want to reduce deaths in pneumonia, you make sure that the parents of young children have resources because as soon as a country becomes more wealthy, pneumonia in children disappears as a cause of child mortality. So the biggest advances in pneumonia mortality and reducing pneumonia mortality, and we've heard a few times here about this enormous number of 700,000 deaths a year, but 20 years ago, in 2000, the number was more than double that. So there's been a revolution in reducing pneumonia deaths, and most of that has been through taking parents out of extreme poverty. So in countries like India, 
in China, in Indonesia, the strides of making the poorest of poor people more wealthy has been very important. If you look at pneumonia deaths in Africa and South Asia, the richest people have the fewest children who die of pneumonia, and it is the poorest of the poor who die. And that's where vaccines now come in, because you would think that vaccines will only protect those who are vaccinated. But the most important vaccine to protect against pneumonia, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which protects kids from the major cause of pneumonia death from six months of age onwards, not only protects kids who are vaccinated, but by interrupting transmission, it actually protects unvaccinated children as well. So once you vaccinate about 60% of the kids in the community, you can reach out and protect even the unvaccinated kids who are the ones who are at the most risk of mortality. We have a lot of exciting things happening in the pneumonia space. Since the last meeting, the Gates Foundation has committed $300 million towards new vaccines and prevention of pneumonia. And it will be a commitment from the Gates Foundation uh, at this forum that we will spend a further $200 million in the next 18 months also on pneumonia prevention. We have, we have a number of sessions uh, which will focus on the very exciting new vaccines uh, which are coming soon. We expect next month the first vaccine for RSV. RSV is a virus which kills babies from pneumonia in the first six months of life. We've never had a vaccine for RSV. The first vaccine may be licensed in the United States next month. But the United States is not the place where children die of RSV. So we have committed to make that vaccine available around the world too and there are future vaccines which will be discussed at this meeting too. So in summary then, I want to say how excited I am that pneumonia is the focus of our attention. I want to thank the very many groups that we have partnered with and thank you all for your attention and contribution to preventing pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kugman. And now we welcome to the stage Mr. Gustavo Suarez Pertiera, UNICEF Spain. Thank you, Dr. Castano. Alteza Real, autoridades, señoras y señores, que supongo que están ahí, muchas gracias a nuestros compañeros de viaje, a la Caixa, a la Fundación Billy Melinda Gates, que nos anima con los anuncios que nos hace, a los gobiernos presentes, al resto de socios y aliados, y a todos aquellos de ustedes que vienen de muchas partes del mundo para acompañarnos en este foro. El foro aborda efectivamente uno de los mayores y más graves desafíos con los que se enfrentan los niños y niñas en la lucha por su supervivencia en todo el mundo. Hablamos, yo también quiero decirlo, de la enfermedad infecciosa que más muertes produce entre los más pequeños. Se ha repetido que cada año se cobra la vida de aproximadamente 700.000 niños y niñas menores de 5 años. Pero hay que insistir. 2.000 niños mueren cada día de neumonía. Una muerte cada 45 segundos. Y todas estas muertes ocurren en países de ingresos bajos y medianos y casi todas son fácilmente prevenibles. 
estamos ante un desafío especialmente relevante que se agrava tras la COVID-19, cuya crisis sanitaria mundial ha provocado el mayor retroceso en la vacunación infantil en casi tres décadas, según datos del Informe Mundial de Infancia 2023 que acabamos de publicar en UNICEF. Según este informe, durante la pandemia de COVID-19 fuimos testigos de la mayor caída sostenida de las tasas de vacunación infantil en una generación. Casi 67 millones de niños y niñas han quedado sin vacunar, total o parcialmente, durante los últimos tres años. Vacunas que los podrían mantener a salvo de enfermedades mortales. Además, los niveles de cobertura de vacunación disminuyeron en 112 países. Este retroceso se produjo porque los programas de inmunización rutinarios no pudieron llegar a tantos niños y niñas como lo hacían antes. Hubo interrupciones de los servicios sanitarios, se cerraron clínicas, se paralizaron las importaciones y exportaciones de viales, jeringuillas y otros suministros médicos. Mientras tanto, las familias estaban confinadas, se restringieron los viajes y movimientos de personas y los fondos y el personal sanitario se focalizaron en la respuesta a la COVID-19. Pero no podemos olvidar que las vacunas siguen siendo una de las historias de éxito más notables de la humanidad. Eliminan enfermedades por completo y salvan innumerables vidas. Durante las últimas tres décadas han sido vitales en el esfuerzo por reducir la tasa de mortalidad de niños y niñas menores de cinco años. Por eso, es hora de que los gobiernos y la sociedad vuelvan a comprometerse con las vacunas. Porque las vacunas funcionan, salvan entre 4 y 5 millones de vidas cada año. En UNICEF lo sabemos. Por eso nuestra labor permite vacunar a casi la mitad de los niños y niñas del mundo cada año. Lo sabemos porque estamos en el terreno llevando estas vacunas hasta cualquier rincón del planeta. En el caso que nos ocupa en este foro, es imprescindible, de nuevo lo digo, intensificar el esfuerzo global que permite proteger, prevenir, diagnosticar y tratar la neumonía infantil para poner fin a las muertes evitables de niños y niñas menores de 5 años para 2030. Queda poco tiempo, como se ha dicho, y no podremos lograrlo si no garantizamos que todos los niños estén protegidos con las vacunas que combaten la neumonía, tengan acceso a un diagnóstico rápido y preciso y a un tratamiento eficaz con antibióticos, oxígeno y alimentos terapéuticos para luchar contra la desnutrición. Muchos de los presentes saben bien de qué hablo porque han trabajado con mucho esfuerzo y en situaciones muy complejas para que las campañas de vacunación, los trabajos de diagnóstico y los tratamientos siguieran adelante. Todos los países pueden reducir las muertes infantiles por neumonía a los niveles necesarios para alcanzar los ODS. Estamos a tiempo, pero para ello es imprescindible sostener el esfuerzo financiero extraordinario realizado durante la pandemia, derivando la neumonía y otras causas de muerte infantil, los recursos destinados hasta ahora a la lucha contra la COVID-19. Termino destacando que España coge por segunda vez este foro. Nuestro país tiene la oportunidad de ponerse a la cabeza de este esfuerzo. El gobierno y la sociedad entienden la responsabilidad histórica a la que hacemos frente. Entre todos los actores implicados, muchos de ellos aquí presentes a lo largo de estas sesiones, podemos y debemos coordinar, reflexionar y, canaliz y analizar las acciones o las medidas que se deben poner en marcha desde los gobiernos para reducir estas muertes por neumonía y acelerar el logro de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, el ODS-3 de Supervivencia Infantil. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes. Thank you so much, Mr. Suarez Pertiera.
And let me just take this moment to encourage all of you who haven't yet seen it to really look up UNICEF's latest edition of the State of the World's Children, which is full of information, which will help all of us in these efforts to accelerate action. And now we welcome to the stage, Mr. Anton Leis Garcia of the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation. Thank you very much, uh, Theo, for, for this introduction. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Senora, uh, President of UNICEF Spain, querido Gustavo, uh, Dr. Klugman, uh, dear friends, uh, thank you very much. Uh, deep thanks for this invitation to this very, very important meeting. And I join uh, Her Royal Highness in welcoming all of you to Spain. We are very proud, we were very proud to host the first uh, global forum three years ago, and we are prouder to host you again on this second forum. Three years and one pandemic later, we are here again discussing pneumonia and discussing global health, a top priority for us. You know where the world is now, competing crisis. Uh, we were just uh, overcoming, in many parts of the world, the triple crisis of COVID-19, health of course, but social and economic. And we are facing now new challenges in form of food insecurity, or protracted conflicts of course in Ukraine, but in other parts, on other parts of the world. But these are also times of opportunity and development cooperation needs to stand up to the, to the challenge. And I think this very meeting is indeed an opportunity. We cannot be uh, making trade-offs between these challenges. We need to confront all of them and we need to tackle them together. This uh, meeting and is, of course, bringing partners that are very close partners to us, very like-minded partners, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and UNICEF, UNICEF Spain and UNICEF globally. Very like-minded partners with whom we have a very close uh, partnership and with whom we work on a daily basis all over the world. But I think this meeting also brings two topics that are very dear to our hearts. On the one hand, global health, and on the other hand, children's rights, because that is what this is all about. It's not just a technical issue, it's not just a matter of global health. It is about the human rights of children. We are at the times of opportunity. You are visiting Spain after we have enacted a new law on development cooperation and global solidarity that commits to achieve in 2030 0.7% of our gross national product in ODA, in official development assistance. We are stepping up to this challenge. We think that when you have global challenges such as this, of course the pandemic, of course this other pandemic of pneumonia in the global south, you need to step up and you need to work with others. In this law, we are also making global health and children's rights a top priority. We've been working on children's rights for a very, very long time, and our colleagues at UNICEF know this very well, because this is a work shared with civil society, of course, partners in this global as well. Um, this is a priority, not just for the government, but for Spanish civil society, and we consider this not just as a sector, but as also a cross-sectoral priority. It's cross-cutting to everything we do, from education to health to governance. We need to focus on children because actually, 50% of the population living in poverty are under 18 years of age. So by tackling the, the question of children, we're tackling poverty and we're talking many other uh, challenges. We are focusing on human rights. And that's, as I said, this is what all this is about. The principle of non-discrimination, the best interests of the child, the right of girls and boys to survival and development, and the right to express their opinions and to be taken into account in policy making. In, uh, all the spheres in Spain, all over the world. Uh, we have a strategy, a specific strategy for children's rights that tackles from democratic governance, the vulnerability, social protection, gender equality. We are a feminist development cooperation. And I think this agenda is also very much connected with the agenda of, of course, of gender equality, environmental sustainability, humanitarian action, global citizenship. But from Guatemala to the Sahel, in all humanitarian contexts, in all the contexts where we work, we focus on matters such as nutrition or education that are closely connected to the topic we are discussing today. But 
it's not just about children's rights, it's also about global health. And that's one of the top priorities of our development cooperation. Spain has a lot to offer. Up until 1981, we were a developing country ourselves. We were recipients of ODA. In 1986, and I think Gustavo was part of these governments, we enacted a law that gave universal access to all Spaniards to a public quality and rather, I would say, efficient and effective health system. And that's actually what we want for countries all over the world. We are working multilaterally. Of course, we have a deep and rich collaboration with, with Gabi. This is a solid collaboration that kicked off in uh, 2006 and is expected to continue at least, and I would hope, beyond 2035. And this partnership, of course, with Gabi and everyone working on vaccination, that is so important. And it's all the more important with the amounts of disinformation and misinformation that is going on around the world these days, is based on the shared belief that childhood vaccination is among the most effective and efficient prevention methods of diseases such as pneumonia, together with other priorities, clean water, sanitation, and so on. We also highly value the Business Alliance for Vaccination, this multi-actor alliance with the private sector led by La Caixa, and I would like also to, to thank them for, for this work, and the work and actions of academic, scientific organizations in our country, such as Is Global, that has been also mentioned by Her Royal Highness, also a long-standing partner of Spanish cooperation. We are proud of what we are achieving together uh, on the fight against pneumonia. There is a backsliding, we need to catch up on the fight against other diseases. Yesterday, we celebrated World Malaria Day, uh, but we are falling short. And I think we have the risk of this momentum that we achieved before the pandemic fading away. Uh, it's true the elderly, I think Dr. Klugman alluded to this, the elderly were the biggest losers of the health dimension of the COVID-19 crisis. But children are probably the biggest losers of the economic and social dimensions of this crisis. And I'm thinking of the 48 million zero-dose children that should be the focus of our priorities. What it is that we should do, and that we as a Spain commit to be doing. First, we need to act multilaterally with Gabi and other partners for universal vaccination coverage. And in countries where that are not Gabi eligible, we will continue to offer our experience, the experience of this country on vaccination and our capacity to achieve the goal of no, no child left unprotected. Number two, we need to support and increase nutritional support and food security. We are in a food security crisis. And I think, again, as I said, there is no choice. We need to tackle the food security crisis that is going on across the world. And we need to tackle also global challenges, such as health as well. Third, we need to intensify, increase our financing against, on the, of the fight against the determinants of health. Dr. Klugman alluded to some of them. There is poverty, there is inequalities, environmental determinants as well, water, sanitation, air pollution. I mentioned yesterday was World Malaria Day. Spain has quite a lot to say against the fight against malaria, where our collaboration with a Global South partner, such as Mozambique, through the center of Manisa, has been able to give hope uh, of having a workable uh, uh, vaccine against malaria. But the pneumonia is also a big challenge, and it's a challenge that, as it has been said already, is completely um, Tackable. We really can handle this and we can have results. Number four, we need to invest, and I underline and underscore the word investment because these are not expenditures, it's really an investment and it's an investment not just for the benefit of societies in the global south, it is an, an investment for societies of the global north as well that also be, be protected with this with this investment in strengthening health systems. We are learning the lessons, the countries that have done best, and I think when one looks back, Spain has not done bad in challenging the pandemic. And I think one of the reasons is that we have strong health systems. We need to tackle, of course, specific diseases, but we also learned the lessons that one of the best ways of doing so is strengthening global systems. And we are ready, of course, to do that. Number five, the big P, partnerships. And we need to strengthen those partnerships. I think this very meeting and the participation of actors from multilateral institutions, governments, the private sector is a, is a good example. And six, we should not lose sight of interconnected challenges, gender equality, climate, and so on, that we know can have positive spillovers on global health issues, such as tackling pneumonia. Again, this is a moment, a turning point for humanity. Uh, we are overwhelmed with crisis, uh, to tell you the truth. All development actors are, but we should not lose momentum. We need to learn the conclusions, we need to take the lessons learned from the pandemic, and we need to invest in our health systems. We're at a turning point in a way. 
There are overlapping crises, but we should not make a choice. We need to tackle really all of them. And we need to invest in global health. We need to invest in children because that's the future of humanity. I quote Theo when she said, we know what we need to do, and that's a good thing. And we know that this is a problem that can be fixed. So let's just get to work. And when working, you can count on Spain and Spanish development cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anton. And thank you again to the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation. At a time when many countries are either stalling or backtracking on international aid, it's really wonderful to see the commitment that you are giving, both financial, but also in terms of human resources and passion to the struggle that we have. And now, with thanks to all four of our opening speakers, we're going to move to the heart of the story almost, with a reminder of what is possible and why we do this work. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Adamu Issa. Okay. Um, Her Royal Majesty, Your Excellencies, and uh, fellow participants. Uh, my name is Dr. Adamu. I'm from Nigeria. I work with Silver Children and I'm leading their work uh, on pneumonia. And today I want to talk to you about the story of a child whose name is Bashir, who almost lost his life to pneumonia. And this child had difficulty in breathing in January of 2022. He was only nine months at the time. So his mother, according to her words, and her name is Aisha, she noted the child was having trouble in breathing and he was hearing some noises from his stomach and his chest was stiff. So she felt the need to go to the hospital. And a community health worker, which was trained by our project, his name is Sunny, was visiting the house and he encouraged her to go to a health facility. So they went to a health post in a village which is called Markiba in northern Nigeria. So they went to a health post and the health workers there felt this child is beyond their capacity. So they referred him to a primary health center in a village called Balago. It was a 10 minute ride on a bike from Marikiba. So at Balago, a good coincidence happened. One of our project staff, her name is Patience Alfred. She was also visiting the facility. So this community worker together with the health workers there suspected that Bashir has pneumonia, malaria, anemia, and also was dehydrated from a recent episode of diarrhea, four in one child. So they also suspected he might need oxygen. So what they did was to refer him to the next level of primary health care, uh, another facility called Kiawa Primary Health Center. Uh, this is what we call a flagship health facility, uh, which is supported by our project. So at Kiawa, they met a medical officer whose name is Dr. Garkua. This medical officer confirmed the diagnosis of pneumonia. He confirmed that this child was anemic, was dehydrated. He used a pulse oximeter to determine whether the child needed oxygen. But luckily, the child did not need oxygen. So this medical doctor prescribed antibiotics, antimalarials, and was able to give some transfusion. Uh, I should say that at Balago, there was a problem before coming to this facility. Uh, the parents of Bashir actually ran out of money. They did not have any more money to go ahead. And Bashir was at the crossroads. 
what should they do? So the patients, Alfred, who was our staff, supported them financially with some money for transportation, but also requested for a waiver for some fees for the child. So that is why at the Kiawa facility, he was assessed, he was treated, and he was given all he needed. And after five days, he was discharged. But there was another problem. He was malnourished. There was malnutrition in that child. So even though he was discharged, his mother was taught how to prepare tropic food at home, and they kept giving him that food, and it took him two months to fully recover from four problems plus malnutrition. So Bashir was actually not fully vaccinated. He received only one dose of pentavalent vaccine, and after that, he dropped out. So the project I'm working on, uh, the Inspiring Project, actually vaccinated about 60,000 children in Nigeria. We have trained about 800 health workers in IMCI, in immunization, nutrition, and very importantly, in pulse oximetry and oxygen therapy. We have also equipped some of these facilities with oxygen systems and oxygen devices. And you could see that when the health systems are strengthened, when you have a primary health care that is functional, when you have committed and educated community health workers, the chances of Bashir to succeed are much higher. So that is how Bashir was able to succeed. And we are so happy to report that before I came to Madrid, I went back to Marikiva and I saw Bashir. Bashir is approaching two years now. He is doing well, he's running, and he is healthy. I also saw his mother, and her name is Aisha, if you remember. Aisha has a message to all of you. And Aisha is saying she is very, very grateful to those health workers that help her child to survive, to the community workers, to organizations, and of course to GSK, the founder of our project in Nigeria. She also asked God Almighty to bless all of you. So thank you very much. This is the end of my story. All right. Okay. There apparently isn't any sound from my headphones. So Rebecca, we're going to have a, a mildly long distance conversation. <laughs> so I'm really delighted um, to introduce Rebecca to all of you. She's one of the most exciting talents that I've seen on our continent. And when I see this kind of young women's leadership, it makes me know that we can reach all of the targets around transformation that we're working towards. And so, Rebecca, you've been working on women and girls' rights across the continent. And I wanted you to just start off first with telling me why you think that this issue of child survival is important and is a part of the work that you have been doing. Okay. Get cozy. <laughs> Come here. I'll come to you. <laughs> this is quite okay. Good morning. Uh, such a pleasure for me to be here this morning. And thank you so much, Tio, for the kind introduction. 
Uh, well, maybe straight to um, your question. So I would like to start by maybe sharing a short story about a girl called Teresia. Uh, she's 18 years of age, um, just completed her lower secondary education, which I would say is a miracle for many of the girls in her areas because only one third of girls who complete primary education end up uh, completing lower secondary education in Tanzania. And this is also uh, a miracle to even some of the group members who Teresia belongs to, a group that we actually work with in our empowerment program in Kongwa, uh, Tanzania, where many of our group members, they already have their first uh, child at that age, below 20, and some, they even have their second, and few are already married at that young age. So this conversation for us is important because when you look at data around child survival, child death, I think if you just go below the line and really question this data, a lot of young women, adolescent girls and young women, give birth, uh, who give birth uh, before the age of 20, they're behind you know, many of the child death that we actually talk about. So for us, this conversation is important and it actually comes back home because when we talk about child survival, I think if we are not centering girls' agents, looking at their power, their ability to actually decide with whom they want to have a baby with and when they want to have a baby, then this conversation will not be complete. But it's also about looking at their voice, you know, deciding what is important to them. And of course, the leadership. And the leadership, that's where I think I and my constituency actually comes in. We have seen how young women have been at the center of pushing for progressive narrative in our communities. I, in particular, with others, we are working in Tanzania to actually ensure as many girls are able to stand up and speak up for their rights, they know their rights, and actually work with the government to change some of the discriminatory legal frameworks that we have in the country, including the Law of Marriage Act, which allows girls as young as 14 to get married. So this conversation for us is important because we know girls are the biggest bet if we are talking about survival, if you're talking about thriving together. Thank you, Rebecca. So you speak a lot about intersectionality. What in that, in terms of the approach that we should be taking, how does intersectionality really play its part in accelerating what we do? Uh, maybe borrowing from some of the speakers who gave their remarks in the morning, they talk about the importance of working together and not working in silos. So for me, intersectionality, I would not just talk about it as intersectionality, but broaden it a little bit. I'll call it intersectional collaboration and accountability. Intersectional collaboration and accountability. Intersectional collaboration in a way that when we look at different actors, especially the government, and I'm very privileged to be among uh, leaders from the continent where I'm proud to come from, who are here, leading some of the very important work around promoting health uh, in the continent. Uh, but what I would say, if we are looking at the issue of child survival or vaccine, for instance, and we are not really looking at you know, other uh, uh, layers, you know, manifestations like you know, reproductive rights, issues of economic justice, climate justice, then all of this will actually not bring the desired outcome or results that we want to see. But intersectional uh, collaboration for me is also about government ministries to not work in silos. So when we look at uh, ministries of health, for instance, the issue of child survival for me is not just about, it's not just a health issue, it's also a gender equality issue. So how are the ministries of gender, for instance, in our countries, how are the ministries of, of education in our countries working together to address these issues? Because all the results are really interrelated. 
it's a pr there's a proven fact that when you invest in education for girls, the children who are born with w women or mothers who have attained at least a high level of education are 30% lower in risk of dying you know, when they are young. So that's important. If we are not addressing the issue of access to education for girls, looking at you know, the barriers that keeps girls out of school, then as much as we'll be looking at vaccines, you know, the immunization and how we are really catching up, at the end of the day, we'll find ourselves working in, in cycles. So for me, working in silos is really working in cycles. You know, you are solving the problem, but you're really, you find yourself in the same, same problem. And accountability is really looking at how, when we look at resourcing uh, initiatives and efforts around education for girls, around, you know, uh, economic justice, around climate justice, how are we also looking at, you know, the broader aspects of, you know, commitment and political will, because then that's become a very critical discussion. So intersectional, I would say intersectional collaboration and accountability is really a panacea to all of this and, you know, many of the things that we've been talking about this morning. So. Yeah. Looking at the people that we have here, many of whom are working in different sectors, in our health ministries, in civil societies, yes. um, donor partners, uh, a whole range, academics, mm -hmm. a whole range of people. What would be your message to them? What do you want them to mm -hmm. take home and act on? I think the, the, the first thing is the most, the most sustainable vaccine in promoting child survival is investing on girls' agents. I think that's the first message I would like you to take home. Vaccines are very effective, but I will talk about sustainability. Investing on girls' agents, betting on their power, their voice, and leadership is something that will actually ensure what, whichever effort we are putting today will go beyond 2030. Because these are going to be you know, grow, are going to, to grow and be the, the women and, you know, the mothers to these children. So if we work around enhance, enhancing their ability to decide about their bodies, you know, their abilities to actually stand up and speak out for their rights, you know, their ability to actually show up as human beings, you know, and really question the power relations, the interest, the socialization in our communities, which for many years have disadvantaged girls and women, then for sure, I can assure you, this will be your biggest bet. And maybe we'll not even come to 2030. We'll start to already see the progress around not just the child survival, but the layers of other inequalities that happens in our community. Rebecca, thank you so much. I hope everybody will join me. Thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, a great message for all of us to bear in mind as we have these discussions over the next two days. And now we'd like to, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dines Kasungami and her panel who are going to discuss National Child Survival Progress. Or not, as the case may be. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that they've got the message that it's happening. So, while we're waiting for Dr. Dines, um, to come onto stage. I suppose I just want to reiterate the consistency that we've had in our messages of welcome and in our opening speakers around not working in silos, around building on our health knowledge and technology with the information that we have around social transformations that we need to make. And they have arrived. So if we can welcome, please, Dr. Dines Kasungami and her panel.
and I will leave Dr. Dines to introduce. Good morning. So excited to be here this morning as we shift and talk about National Child Survival Progress. And in this session, we have colleagues from Somalia and India, and uh, we are going to get into what countries can do in order to achieve the progress that we are talking about. Dr. Gosh Smita is the additional commissioner in charge Child Health, Federal Ministry of, uh, Federal Ministry of Health and Family Health in India. And we have Dr. Uba Ahmed, who is a family health advisor from Somalia. That's Dr. Aloge Boladele from the Federal Minister of Health in Nigeria. She's the Director of Family Health. Okay. I was expecting the map to go up, but while we wait, great. Take a moment for you to scan this map. With seven years to go towards the 2030 target, 54 countries are off track and need accelerated action. This map gives us the picture where we will be in 2030 at the current level of speed of addressing child mortality. And as you can see, while most of the world would have achieved or would be very close to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal target of 25 or fewer deaths per 100 live births, in Africa, the story will be different. So of the 54 countries that are off track, almost 80% are in Africa. You will also note that there is a concentration around West and Central Africa, so the deeper red color there shows the countries that are most of track, need the most urgent action, but these are also the countries that are affected by chronic conflict. So their challenge is compounded. We also note that in these countries, when we look at mortality after the post neonatal period, almost 70% of deaths are occurring in the age of 1 to 59 months. And the leading causes of death in this age group are pneumonia, what we're talking about here, diarrhea, malaria, and underlying nutrition. And we've heard from uh, many speakers this morning that we know what to do about these conditions. The last thing I wanted to say and I want to emphasize is that despite this picture, we know that this target is achievable even in countries with resource constraints. That gives us hope. 
So we have examples of Ethiopia making great progress, Malawi, Senegal, almost there. So with leadership, with commitment, the target is achievable. And so, even as we turn to hear the progress in these countries, we know that we can do it. We have three questions to frame our conversation this morning. How are ministries of health planning to rapidly accelerate these mortality declines? Second is how can we learn from the countries that have made progress and are making progress? And lastly, how can international partners come along and support the governments, the ministries of health to make progress? So I'll now turn to the panelists. And I'll start with you, Dr. Aloge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nigeria is home to 36 million children under five and projected to rise to 43 million by 2060. How does the Federal Minister of Health hope to address the challenges we talk about, particularly thinking about uh, your country where the state and the local governments are the main drivers in addressing this mortality reduction? Thank you very much. Uh, you, you mentioned it, you know, that the federal government is coordinating health nationally and then a lot of implementation lies at the subnational level and at the local government level. And that's where a lot of problems exist. But as far as the Federal Ministry of Health is concerned, we recently launched a national um, policy document, uh, National Integrated Pneumonia Control Strategy, to help us to rapidly solve these problems towards achieving the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the, one of the important points is that to be able to coordinate both nationally and subnationally, the government formed a technical working group through the policy implementation to be able to involve in, um, academias, state um, governments, and um, federal ministries, primary health care workers, to be able to coordinate the um, control of pneumonia in the country. And that we have started running with. And then we we'll also have um, um, increased data collection, you know, to drive accountability, to drive um, 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 evaluation and monitoring. But one of the most important steps we have taken now is a, uh, a maternal perinatal child uh, death surveillance response. Mm -hmm. We want every, every death to be accounted for. And that bill is already at the office of the president. We're waiting the assent so that every death, both not only child death, not only perinatal death, also maternal death, which are all interrelated, will be accounted for it will be accounted for so that we can be able to monitor the causes of deaths and be able to solve the problems, you know, and reduce this uh, drastically. Another major uh, activity that we, through the policy, as Federal Ministry of Health, is uh, implementing is integrated uh, community care management through the National Primary Health Care Development Program. We found out that a lot of community health influencers, community health um, promotion services have started. As a matter of fact, um, they have been able to influence um, bringing the patients, the children, to the health centers and the right places for treatment. Because a lot of the deaths happen where, you know, uh, uh, even in the homes where the the, even the families, they, are, they don't even want to take the children 
because they don't have money. But because, through this program, the government is working as 1% of the national budget, a primary basic health care provision fund, to be able to help the, you know, the, the less privileged to assess health. So there's a lot of um, um, community work, uh, care management going on to be able to reach out to the community to bring the patients in for treatment at the level where, um, where they can afford or where they can be treated freely. That, is, that has been found to help to reduce the deaths from pneumonia in Nigeria recently. And then another thing that we are doing is uh, to improve service delivery. A lot of the problems are due to the fact that because there's malaria, endemic malaria, a lot of, uh, th there's a lot of mistake treating the, the children for malaria for a long time and not realizing that it's uh, um, pneumonia. So because there's a lot of activities going on that level also to be able to improve service delivery. And another one is the supply of commodities that are essential for the treatment of um, uh, uh, pneumonia, that is the vaccines, the, the, um, the antibiotics to be available at all levels, the oxygen, the pulse oximeter, and also the government is working very hard in recent times to improve nutrition, especially uh, among the under five children. Government borrowed about $180 million recently through the World Bank, and we have started distributing supplements to make sure that wasting is reduced so that less children will be susceptible to pneumonia in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story from Nigeria. Next question, Dr. Ahmed. Somalia has to increase the rate of decline from 3 to 17 percent. You have a lot of actions to do. How do you go about prioritizing what to focus on? Oh, thank, thank you so much, excellent colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning. I am here on behalf of our director, Ahmed, who couldn't meet because he's, un he's not feeling well. Uh, Somalia is recovering decades of uh, conflict, aggravated by drought and food insecurity. Um, the health system is recovering. Uh, our priority to reduce uh, child mortality, under child mortality, where pneumonia and diarrhea are the leading cause, the government has put this priority. First of all, we have to strengthen our immunization coverage, routine immunization, I mean. Since 2021, the last forum in Barcelona, we have improved. Our PENTA coverage was 12% and measles was 23 and actually we are 40 and 50% respectively, pneumonia, uh, PENTA and measles. And also we are going to improve the diagnosis and the treatment at community level and at health facility. We have deployed with the support of World Bank and other partners, community health workers, family health workers, train it in ICM, Integrated Community Case Management, to diagnose and prompt treat pneumonia. We have provided them supplies, amoxicillin, to treat at, at community level and to recognize severe cases and to refer them to health facility. And also our health workers have, have been trained and we are going to strengthen that in integrated management of newborn and child health illness. And also that will facilitate the diagnosis and treatment at facility level. We also have to improve our nutrition. We have the high level of GAM in globally, global acute malnutrition in Somalia because we are facing drought, continually drought, and, and, um, and food security um, in the country. Uh, uh, we have pl planned with our partners the global action for child on child wastage and roadmap for Somalia to reduce and improve child nutrition. Um, the other things uh, we are planning this year to introduce pneumocortical vaccine, we know it's the it's leading vaccine on preventing pneumonia, not only the case of death, but also hospitalization. We have uh, created um, a task force, national immunization task force, and a roadmap and shared with Gavi. However, we face a critical challenge on mobilizing public resource from the national treasury to meet the co-financing obligatory. To realize this critical goal for children in Somalia, we look Gavi and our partners to support 
with VVR to the co-financing commitment, especially for the first years of introduction of these vaccines. We have also improved the availability of oxygen, uh, thanks to resource from COVID-19, as the community, uh, international community had discovered that ex oxygen is essential medicine, not only for the COVID, but pneumonia or all others, uh, respiratory distress, which uh, we can have it from zero at the, at the newborn, a premature to 99. We have improved thanks to our, our supporters and our donors. And now, uh, since the beginning of the COVID, only 26% of health facilities in Somalia has availability of oxygen. And it was only cylindric oxygen concentrated. Now, in, after two years, we have 50% of our health facility has oxygen availability, and also some health facility have oxygen solar powered. We know Somalia, we have also a, a shortage of electricity. Um, and we are uh, also to improve our outdoor uh, pollution. The government, uh, with support of our partners, are planning to electrify 300 health facilities with solar power. Thank you so much. Over, okay. over by my side. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ghosh, India has made a tremendous uh, progress in reducing uh, mortality. You have 135 million under five children. What lessons can you share with uh, colleagues from other countries? Thank you. Uh, good morning to Her Excellency and all other esteemed delegates, panelists. Uh, thank you for mentioning India's progress. Yes, uh, we are on track. We are on track to achieve uh, the SDG targets. Uh, we are presently at, uh, uh, you know, in 2020 report, we are 32. So we are very hopeful that we'll be um, able to achieve it uh, in time, maybe earlier with the annual, uh, you know, decline rate of 6% uh, in the mortality under five mortality. Uh, so uh, in order to share, uh, I must say that this has happened because of the uh, general uh, strengthening of the health system on the whole and with a particular focus on areas which were causing the problems, which are causing the mortalities. Uh, so the neonatal period, which is the most vulnerable period and uh, contributing to about 65 to 75, 70 percent of mortality. So the programs have been developed in which, uh, you know, facility-based newborn care for small and sick children, they have been highly, you know, expanded. We have presently some uh, thousands sick and neonatal care units uh, where, um, you know, the sick and small babies are being treated. 1.2 million, uh, you know, admissions happened last year with less than 10% mortality. Uh, so this has influenced a big deal. And uh, apart from this, uh, you know, facilities, sick for sick facilities, uh, the community-based programs have been given Philip. Uh, the newborns, uh, they are uh, getting six to seven visits by our peripheral health workers uh, in uh, first, 20, first 42 days. And then beyond that, uh, every quarterly they are getting visits for, uh, you know, till 15 months of age. Uh, so that is again a big game changer because a lot of opportunities has been created for uh, making contact with the children uh, so that, you know, to monitor their growth development as well as, you know, uh, to, you know, identify some, uh, you know, illness, sickness, any kind of disease, disorder, deficiencies, and then refer and get them treated. Uh, we have another big uh, program that is, we call it uh, RBSK, which is for the, you know, Anganwadi and school children. Again, we make a lot of uh, contacts uh, twice for each child in the Anganwadis uh, for picking up those who need care. So that way, we have created a lot of point of contacts. Uh, immunization, of course, for 12 uh, vaccine preventable diseases, that has come a very, very big, uh, given a big boost in you know, uh, protecting children against the 
uh, killing disorders and the latest one uh, being uh, pneumococcal vaccine which have been uh, rolled out uh, all through the country uh, since 21. So again, we think it will be a big game changer, especially uh, for killing diseases like pneumonia. Okay. Nutrition again is a major issue. Uh, so promotion of breastfeeding, promotion of uh, supplemental nutrition through our ICDS schemes and, you know, setting up of uh, more than thousand centers where uh, nutritional rehabilitation centers where uh, very uh, severe acute malnutrition children are being treated and uh, avoiding, we are avoiding mortalities there too. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, coming to very focal programs like pneumonia, we have the SARS campaign, which is uh, awareness campaign again, uh, uh, nutrition, uh, pneumonia, uh, which has all the, you know, prevention, promotion, and early treatment aspects and creating awareness in the communities. Uh, out of um, 750 districts, 700 districts are rolling out uh, from February to November each year. Uh, then uh, diarrhea, we have diarrhea and control programs in the, you know, every uh, year, twice we have uh, pre monsoon uh, The other things is the general strengthening, as I told you, uh, it is a primary health care has been given a great Philip. 154,000 health and wellness centers have come up and they are given, uh, you know, there are mid-level service providers who are doing it. In short, I must say that it is, uh, you know, the commitments at the high level, uh, the, you know, partners, we have state part partners, 36 units are there, they are working together as, with us, and all the stakeholders mentioned here, our development partners there with us. And uh, we do believe with all new things have come on quality, on teleconsultation. So with all this, we really hope that we'll be, you know, achieving our target maybe much earlier. And okay. with the motivation and the financial commitment and the commitment of the government. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gosh. Just give the last few minutes to Dr. Fernandez from Mozambique. Uh, the National Director of Public Health. Mozambique has seen a sliding back in routine immunization, DPT, PCV. What are you going to do to get back on track? Bon dia todos. Uh, I was supposed to uh, speak in Portuguese, uh, but I'll do my best uh, to address your question. Uh, in English, uh, and make my translator life easy. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you for your great question. Quick. Mozambique, uh, like other countries, uh, has experienced uh, negative impacts of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we had uh, stockouts of vaccines. Uh, so you have a general sense. The WENIC uh, data shows that uh, for Penta 3, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, the coverage was around 88% uh, and it dropped down to around 61% by the end uh, of 2021. There is a study that uh, we are conducting now uh, to understand specifically the setbacks that we had during the COVID. Also, it shows that around 12% in most of the vaccines setbacks. Uh, so all that uh, led to an accumulation of uh, zero dose Charles around uh, 300,000 kids across the country. Uh, but plus that, as you all know, Mozambique is a country that is extremely vulnerable to uh, extreme weather events. Every year, there are around uh, two to three cyclones that directly affect the health infrastructure. Uh, 
to add on that, unfortunately, in the north, in the north of the country, we are dealing with acts of terrorism, mm. uh, even though the situation is getting better. Uh, so all those things are threats to the public health and uh, have imposed setbacks on the extended immunization program. So what are we doing? What are the plans? Uh, as I mentioned, there are around uh, 300,000 kids that are zero dose, so that's the main goal. Uh, we have put in place uh, a robust uh, recovery plan that uh, is going to be implemented starting this year in July. Uh, fortunately, we have been in, discussing, in discussions with uh, Gavi. Uh, if we get the vaccines, then uh, we'll be able to uh, catch up those kids. But more importantly, the same plan addresses the main uh, bottlenecks of the API program. I mean, uh, uh, all our strategy is based on strengthening the health system, particularly uh, with uh, the API program. Just okay. to conclude, uh, we are also uh, targeting uh, our community health subsystem. Mozambique has around 3,500 community health workers. We do believe that if they are well trained, uh, they can play a great role in terms of recovering the uh, API program. I thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all we had time for, but we've heard uh, community health, focusing on community health workers, looking at the deaths that are happening to learn from what's going wrong, to address it, improving availability of supplies and uh, partnerships, multi-sectoral uh, collaboration, is all uh, going to help us to work together to address this uh, mortality. And after lunch, you will hear about an initiative, the Child Survival Action, where we all get together, international partners and countries, and Sierra Leone is one of the countries leading where we are working together to really address this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Introduce the next uh, session. Professor Mariam Silla from Mali is going to lead our Francophone colleagues in a similar conversation to what we had before. Okay. Merci, Dainès. Bon, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, chers participants. Euh, comme elle l'a dit, je suis euh, professeur Mariam Silla. Je viens du Mali. Oui, euh, et C'est un plaisir, mais surtout un privilège et un honneur d'être avec vous ce matin et surtout d'animer la deuxième partie de ce panel sur la, la survie de l'enfant, les actions prioritaires. Ce panel est constitué par euh, d'éminentes autorités de la santé de trois pays francophones, Euh, J'ai à ma gauche le M. Suleiman Traoré, secrétaire général du ministère de la Santé et du Développement Social du Mali. Euh, à côté, merci M. Traoré d'être avec nous ce matin. Euh, nous avons Dr. Yansane Lamine, secrétaire général du ministère de la Santé de Guinée. Merci M. le secrétaire général. Et Ensuite, nous avons Dr. Gunabou, conseil technique au ministère de la Santé du Burkina Faso. Merci, Dr. Merci d'être avec nous ce matin. Alors, à l'instar de de, du premier panel, ces trois pays que nous avons, à savoir le Mali, 
la Guinée et le Burkina. Euh, quand vous avez suivi la première présentation, les diapositives, vous voyez que ces trois pays sont dans la zone rouge, on va le dire, avec une mortalité de moins de 5 ans très élevée. Et ces trois pays, s'ils doivent atteindre l'objectif de 2030, à savoir de réduire la mortalité et avoir 25 pour 1000 naissances vivantes, je pense qu'ils devraient faire une chute vertigineuse de, des taux de mortalité. Nous allons donc voir avec ces trois autorités de la santé quelles sont les stratégies qui sont mises en œuvre dans les différents pays pour que nous soyons au rendez-vous de 2030. Nous allons commencer par M. Traoré du, du Mali. M. Traoré, mmh. le, le Mali a une mortalité infanto-juvénile, une mortalité de moins de 5 ans qui est très très élevée et nous devons la réduire de façon drastique, passer de 3% de baisse annuellement à 15% de baisse. Celui, cela est un grand, grand défi. Qu'est-ce que le ministère de la Santé du Mali envisage pour atteindre cet objectif Quelles sont les stratégies vraiment innovantes et très efficaces que nous allons mettre en œuvre au Mali pour atteindre cet objectif de 2030 Vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Je salue tout le monde, votre Altesse royale. Et mon pays, comme vous venez de le dire, le Mali, nous sommes dans une situation de crise. Et vous avez, savez quand même qu'il y a un conflit qui se fait dans notre... qui occupe une bonne partie du territoire malien. Donc ça fait que non, la mise en œuvre de nos stratégies connaisse quelques difficultés. Mais par rapport à votre question, je voudrais dire régulièrement que depuis 1999, le Mali a adopté la prise en charge intégrée des maladies de l'enfant. Les enfants, et cette prise en charge est mise en œuvre aujourd'hui au niveau de euh, 64% quand même euh, des districts sanitaires. Et cette prise en charge, nous sommes en train d'aller vers la digitalisation et, la pré, et le pré-service et qui vont nous permettre d'accélérer euh, quand même euh, les choses. Ensuite, nous savons qu'il y a les soins de santé euh, communautaire, donc, et qui couvrent aujourd'hui 73% de nos districts sanitaires. Et nous sommes en train de travailler pour que cette soin de santé, et ces soins de santé mis en œuvre par les agents de santé communautaire depuis 2011 puissent être renforcés et couvrir l'ensemble des districts sanitaires avec une forte implication et appropriation par les communautés. Et en termes aussi, nous savons que les différents programmes ont été impliqués dans l'élaboration de ces différents outils. Il s'agit du programme de vaccination, le programme de lutte contre le paludisme, le programme VIH et autres qui suivent donc, ainsi que la nutrition. Et ces outils qui sont révisés en, euh, périodiquement impliquent l'ensemble des différents acteurs et son, leur mise en jour euh, quand même prend en compte aussi les préoccupations des différents programmes. Nous avons aussi que les indicateurs sont renseignés à travers l'outil DHS2, donc qui est régulièrement aussi mis à jour. Nous savons aussi qu'il faut aller vers une pérennisation en termes de stratégie quand même de, différents, euh, de ces différentes stratégies et l'institutionnalisation surtout des soins essentiels dans la communauté. Donc, en termes d'approche aussi de financement innovant, depuis un moment, le Mali a commencé à mettre en œuvre le financement basé sur les résultats dans un certain nombre de districts sanitaires. Actuellement, nous sommes en train de travailler sur un plan d'institutionnalisation, en même temps aussi d'extension de la mise en œuvre donc, de, du financement basé sur les résultats. Nous pensons quand même que cette mise en œuvre associée avec euh, ce qu'on appelait les agents de santé proactifs, il s'agit d'agents de santé qui vont intervenir dans les domiciles pour identifier et faire la prise en charge et aux besoins renvoyer euh, donc, les euh, cas. Il s'agit notamment donc de ces différentes stratégies que nous sommes en train de développer dans le pays. Merci beaucoup.
Okay, merci, M. Traoré. Nous osons espérer qu'avec ces différentes stratégies euh, et aussi vraiment euh, l'engagement des, des autorités, que nous pourrons arriver au rendez-vous de 2030. Merci, merci à vous. Merci. Euh, maintenant, je vais me tourner vers le euh, docteur Mohamed Lamine Yansani de, de la Guinée. Monsieur le secrétaire général, euh, nous savons que dans nos pays, ce sont les pathologies infectieuses qui sont euh, les principales causes de mortalité, notamment le paludisme, la pneumonie, euh, la diarrhée et la, les méningites. Mais à côté de ces pathologies pour lesquelles Effectivement, nos différents ministères ont des stratégies de, de lutte. Nous avons d'autres pathologies comme les malformations, euh, les pathologies non infectieuses qui sont aussi des tueuses d'enfants de façon générale, on va le dire. Qu'est-ce que la Guinée fait pour ces pathologies qui ne sont pas prises en compte dans des programmes et pour lesquelles il n'y a pas de, on va dire, de, de financement et au niveau de, de nos pays, nous devons quand même nous engager pour diminuer aussi la morbidité et la mortalité de ces pathologies. Donc, nous aimerons avoir l'exemple de, de la Guinée, l'expérience de la Guinée dans cette lutte. Merci. Merci, Madame la modératrice. Je voudrais aussi commencer par dire que nos indicateurs de santé ne sont pas bons de façon générale. Cela a été lié à plusieurs facteurs. Vous vous souvenez de la terrible épidémie, la maladie à virus Ebola que le pays a connue pendant presque trois ans. Juste on sortait de cette épidémie, nous nous sommes retrouvés également avec la pandémie de la COVID-19. Malheureusement, chaque fois qu'il y a des épidémies, c'est toutes les ressources qui devaient aller dans le renforcement du système de santé qui sont orientées pour lutter en priorité contre les épidémies. Cela a donc été un facteur euh, euh, favorisant euh, la non-baisse euh, de la mortalité des enfants. Euh, malgré tous ces aspects, notre pays a mis en place une politique nationale euh, euh, de santé infantile qui inclut toutes les maladies, même ceux qui ne sont pas financés par les autres partenaires. Dans le financement donc, de ces maladies, euh, le budget national intervient énormément, mais nous avons aussi pas mal d'ONG qui supportent euh, le pays dans la réalisation des objectifs. Donc les aspects sur lesquels nous insistons beaucoup dans le cadre de ces maladies, pas seulement infectieuses, mais aussi les, les autres maladies que vous avez citées, il y a toujours le volet prévention qui apparaît clairement. Euh, euh, le deuxième volet, c'est la prise en charge, et, mais également la promotion de la santé pour tout ce qui concerne les autres aspects. La stratégie vraiment que le pays a trouvée pour faire face donc, à tous ces problèmes, afin de réduire considérablement et peut-être de multiplier même euh, nos efforts par 5 ou par 8 afin d'atteindre nos objectifs, a été certainement la stratégie de la santé communautaire. Euh, à, à travers les soins de santé primaire, le pays donc s'est engagé à faire face à un paquet d'activités intégrées, préventives, curatives et promotionnelles à la base, avec les agents de santé communautaire, mais également avec les relais communautaires. Les uns et les autres travaillant ensemble, et avec leurs efforts réunis au niveau des centres de santé. Donc là, euh, euh, des efforts considérables sont mis en place pour euh, pouvoir perpétuer euh, ce programme. Malheureusement, le problème de financement, nous nous sommes rendus compte que la gratuité euh, ou le bénévolat qu'on utilisait avant pour les agents de santé communautaire ne marche plus. Donc le pays a décidé donc, de payer les agents de santé communautaire et les relais communautaires afin de pouvoir pérenniser ce processus. Donc nous sommes euh, dessus. Deux tiers de nos centres de santé ruraux sont inclus dans ce programme. Et partout où ce programme a été mis en place, et le plus souvent avec l'appui de nos partenaires euh, 
technique et financier, euh, les résultats aujourd'hui sont assez visibles. Euh, deux autres stratégies sont en train à l'étude pour être mises en place parce que jusqu'à présent, notre pays n'a pas pu introduire euh, la vaccination contre la, la pneumonie. Donc, euh, c'est une grande tueuse, mais nous sommes en train de faire également des efforts pour pouvoir aller dans ce sens. Et l'un des engagements forts que nous avons pris est qu'à partir de 2024, euh, ce vaccin va intro être introduit dans le pays. Nous travaillerons avec les communautés et surtout, il y aura une action multisectorielle pour pouvoir couvrir tous les autres aspects qui ne sont pas couverts par la santé. Parce qu'on s'est rendu compte que euh, des pathologies comme euh, les accidents de circulation et autres commencent à prendre le dessus et ça touche aussi bien les enfants que les adultes. Donc, madame, ce sont là certaines des mesures qui sont actuellement envisagées par notre pays pour pouvoir rattraper tout le retard considérable que nous avons dans le cadre de la réduction de la mortalité maternelle, compris dans les engagements précédents. Je vous remercie. Okay. Merci, M. le secrétaire général. J'ai bien retenu que c'est surtout la promotion de la santé au niveau communautaire, les activités de santé communautaire. Mais ce que, pour lequel je vous félicite, c'est l'introduction du vaccin contre la pneumonie, parce que, comme vous l'avez dit vous-même, c'est le but de ce forum. Et je pense qu'il est inadmissible que l'on ne fasse rien pour prévenir la pneumonie chez les enfants en les vaccinant, en sachant que la prise en charge est beaucoup plus coûteuse. Donc, comme on dit, mieux vaut prévenir que guérir. Merci à la Guinée pour cela. Euh, alors, mon troisième, je vais dire ma troisième panéliste, c'est le Burkina Faso. Euh, docteur, le Burkina, euh, on le félicite pour les efforts faits par rapport à la vaccination. Le Burkina a pour les vaccins euh, plus, près de, plus de 90% de, de couverture. Et là, je dis bravo au Burkina, mais la mortalité est encore très élevée. Cela nous amène à dire que ce n'est pas seulement la vaccination, il faut d'autres actions pour réduire la mortalité des moins de 5 ans. Et ma question, c'est quelles sont les autres stratégies que le Burkina a mis en œuvre ou va mettre en œuvre pour être au rendez-vous de 2030 vous avez la parole, docteur. Ok, merci, euh, professeur Silla, madame la modératrice, euh, excellence et chers participants au forum. Et merci d'abord pour l'invitation à ce forum et d'avoir invité le Burkina Faso et pour ce panel. Et il faut dire qu'au Burkina Faso, euh, nous avons également, comme vous l'avez dit, un taux de vaccination vraiment confortable mais la mortalité des décès infantiles est toujours élevée. Et les causes dues à ces décès sont notamment les affections néonatales, qui prend en compte la prématurité, les infections néonatales et autres. Et nous avons également le paludisme, la pneumonie, la diarrhée chez l'enfant. Et pour lutter contre en fait, toutes ces maladies, euh, nous avons mis en place un certain nombre d'actions euh, pour la survie de l'enfant et améliorer la santé et des enfants de moins de 5 ans en vue de réduire la, les, la mortalité évitable. Et comme principale action, nous pouvons déjà dire qu'en termes de santé mère et enfant, et nous avons mis en place euh, un concept déjà et qui prend en compte les mille premiers jours de vie du nouveau-né. Et ce concept, c'est un paquet vraiment global de, de soins essentiels qui prend en compte euh, la CPN, la consultation prénatale, le traitement préventif intermittent, et la vaccination, le dépistage de la malnutrition et entre autres. Et en plus de ce concept-là, nous avons la mise en place, par exemple, de la prise en charge intégrée de la maladie de l'enfant et au niveau global de tout le pays. Mais nous avons également la mise en œuvre de cette prise en charge intégrée de la mère et de l'enfant 
au niveau communautaire. Et en faisant une parade au Burkina Faso, nous avons euh, la promotion de la santé communautaire, dont un village, deux agents de santé communautaire. Et au total, nous avons au niveau du Burkina euh, environ euh, 17 000 agents communautaires pour tout le pays. Et ces 17 000 agents communautaires la soutiennent également. Ils ont un paquet d'activités qu'ils mettent en œuvre, euh, notamment la planification familiale, euh, la vaccination, euh, la prise en charge euh, du nouveau-né en prenant en compte les possibles infections bactériennes graves. Et nous avons également euh, les soins essentiels, les autres soins essentiels tels que le paludisme. Et nous avons également en marge de cela euh, la multisectorialité de la nutrition. Nous avons relevé un peu l'ancrage de la multisectorialité de la nutrition qui est prise en charge au niveau du ministère de la Santé et qui prend en compte certains départements ministériels. Nous avons l'eau, l'assainissement, la protection sociale, euh, nous avons la recherche, nous avons euh, également l'agriculture et les ressources animales. Et donc ce cadre sectoriel là, permet de mettre en œuvre certaines activités en, en lien avec la nutrition de l'enfant, également la prise en charge de la malnutrition. En termes de paludisme, nous avons également relevé l'ancrage en créant, au lieu d'un programme, nous avons créé un secrétariat permanent en charge de l'élimination du paludisme. Et également, avec ce, ce programme, nous avons les campagnes de prévention saisonnière du paludisme que nous effectuons dans tout le Burkina. Et en termes de cela, nous avons également, après le paludisme, et, et comme je l'ai dit, et la santé communautaire. Et ces agents de santé communautaire, là, dont deux par village, et soutiennent un peu les activités des structures de soins déconcentrés. Et en plus de ça, nous avons, le Burkina a mis en place la gratuité de la femme enceinte, de la prise en charge de la femme enceinte et des enfants de moins de 5 ans. Donc, toute femme enceinte qui arrive dans une formation sanitaire et un enfant de moins, moins de 5 ans ne paye aucun frais. Tout est à la charge de l'État. Et nous avons également, et cela depuis 2016, en 2021, nous avons institué la, la gratuité de la planification familiale sur tout le pays. En plus de cela, nous avons mis en œuvre euh, les campagnes de, de chimio-prévention saisonnière du paludisme, mais également la gratuité et des moustiquaires imprégnés à longue durée d'action pour les femmes enceintes et les enfants de moins de 1 an. Donc toutes ces actions-là visent réellement à contribuer à éviter un certain nombre de décès chez les enfants. Mais il faut dire que euh, beaucoup reste à faire. Et c'est pour cela qu'en termes de perspective, nous prévoyons déjà euh, la mise en œuvre d'un certain nombre d'actions, notamment le cadre institutionnel et programmatique de la santé maternelle et néonatale ainsi que infantile. Mais euh, nous avons également la promotion de la santé communautaire parce qu'actuellement, euh, nous sommes en train de recruter environ 15 000 agents de santé communautaire, notamment pour les deux grandes villes du Burkina, et Ouagadougou et Bobo du Lasso. Et, mais également, euh, cela est en lien également avec le ministère de la Jeunesse qui va également recruter des volontaires qui seront des superviseurs de ces agents communautaires. En marge de cela, euh, nous voulons également et mettre à l'échelle des centres de production d'oxygène dans, dans tous nos hôpitaux. Et je voudrais par là dire qu'il y a moins de dix jours, nous avons inauguré le centre de production d'oxygène du, du centre hospitalier universitaire pédiatrique Charles de Gaulle, euh, qui a eu son nouveau centre de production d'oxygène et pour la prise en charge des enfants. Et ensuite, c'est de pour continuer la promotion et également et continuer dans l'amélioration de l'acquisition des équipements et des médicaments essentiels ainsi que des consommables médicaux. 
Et donc, euh, je voudrais un peu terminer par là, euh, pour dire que c'est juste une synthèse des, des actions que nous sommes en train de mener. Et, et donc, nous voulons partager avec les participants euh, de ce forum. Je vous remercie. Ok, merci docteur. Mais je voudrais aussi dire que ce sont beaucoup d'actions et la plupart de ces actions sont menées depuis euh, plusieurs années et n'ont pas eu un grand impact sur la mortalité. Maintenant, nous voulons agir. Nous voulons agir pour que cette mortalité diminue de façon drastique, on va le dire. Parmi tout ce que vous avez cité, qu'est-ce que vous pensez être vraiment là, là où deux ou trois stratégies pertinentes qui permettront d'être au rendez-vous parce que tout ce qu'on a dit, on le fait depuis, mais les résultats ne sont pas là. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Les mille premiers jours, je pense, oui. L'oxygène, oui. Est-ce que vous voyez une autre stratégie ou est-ce qu'il y aura un engagement financier du ministère pour que tout ce qu'il y a sur le papier, on va dire, soit fait de façon concrète sur le terrain pour que nous ayons des résultats Ok, merci pour cette question. Euh, je dirais que euh, l'engagement, le Burkina Faso est déjà engagé et le Burkina Faso contribue en termes de ressources financières du budget de l'État pour la mise en œuvre d'un certain nombre d'activités, notamment avec tous les partenaires techniques et financiers pour cela. Et comme je l'ai dit, et dans l'action en fait, d'éviter la mortalité chez ces enfants-là, c'est la promotion régale et réellement de la santé communautaire à la base. Et comme on le dit, nous avons beaucoup de zones à défi sécuritaire avec beaucoup de déplacés internes au sein du Burkina Faso. Donc ce sont ces agents de santé communautaire qui nous aident et dans ces sites de déplacés internes pour la prise en charge et la veille sanitaire au niveau de ces populations-là. Et il faut dire que le défi réellement, c'est à ce niveau parce que euh, la prise en charge intégrée est souvent un peu difficile. Parce que dans ces sites, les populations partent et viennent, mais ce pas les mêmes populations. Donc vous pouvez dire aujourd'hui, euh, tous les enfants sont vaccinés et tous les, tous les enfants ont eu une veille sanitaire, mais euh, une heure après, vous avez un... Un, un, une venue massive de population due à, euh, au terrorisme. Et c'est là notre défi, c'est d'assurer une meilleure prise en charge de tous ces enfants qui se trouvent dans ces zones. Parce que les zones qui n'ont pas de problème, et les, la prise en charge est réellement assurée à ce niveau-là. Donc l'engagement, c'est déjà ça. Mais l'engagement, un autre engagement, c'est qu'on on a réellement euh, une insuffisance en équipement, notamment l'oxymètre de poux, qui manque réellement dans nos structures de soins. Donc ça, c'est déjà un engagement d'assurer et d'élaborer, de mettre en œuvre un plan et qui va et permettre l'acquisition de euh, ces oxymètres de poux-là et d'assurer la mise en œuvre réellement de la construction de ces centres d'oxygène, de production d'oxygène dans nos gros centres et d'assurer l'oxygénothérapie dans les centres déconcentrés. Okay, merci. Ça, ce sont des actions concrètes. Et voilà. je pense que nous devons plutôt mettre euh, ces actions-là en, en œuvre. Euh, je vais peut-être, avant de clôturer, poser une question subsidiaire au, au Mali qui vient de faire euh, euh, finir une étude sur la prise en charge de la pneumonie dans les, les centres, à partir de centres communautaires et les centres de les hôpitaux de, de district. Et le gouvernement, avec ses résultats, le ministère de la Santé a quand même pris des, des actions, des mesures pour améliorer la prise en charge de, de la pneumonie. Monsieur le secrétaire général, est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler de quelques-unes de ces mesures. D'accord. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais rappeler ici quand même que pour mettre l'accent sur ça, 
que nous avons déjà créé une structure autonome qu'on a appelé Office national d'appui à la santé de la reproduction. C'est pour être focalisé sur ces différentes actions. Et je pense que l'Office a travaillé avec les différents acteurs pour mener ces études. Effectivement, il y a deux semaines, nous avons fait la restitution des résultats de cette étude-là. Donc, à partir de là, effectivement, nous avons pris l'engagement au niveau du département d'aller vers la mise en œuvre des recommandations qui sont issues de l'étude. Il s'agit donc d'aller effectivement vers la mise en place au niveau euh, périphérique, au moins dans 50% des districts sanitaires, de, quand même l'oxymètre de Pou, et en même temps aussi au niveau tertiaire de mettre à 100%. Et nous savons aussi qu'aujourd'hui, nous sommes à, euh, on s'est engagé à couvrir euh, au niveau de l'ensemble du pays la mise à disposition des oxygènes, euh, de, au niveau de l'ensemble quand même des formations sanitaires. Je pense que la situation sera communiquée par mon collègue qui va intervenir après. Donc c'est pour dire que euh, l'engagement quand même du pays est là pour euh, assurer et attaquer cette quand même, cause de mortalité au niveau des enfants qui sont les plus fragiles. Donc, merci beaucoup. D'accord, merci. Mmh. En espérant que, voilà, ce sont des actions mmh. qui vont être réellement mises en œuvre sur le terrain. Mmh. Euh, monsieur Dr Yansani, je ne sais pas si vous, si vous avez euh, une expérience par rapport à la prise en charge de la pneumonie qui permet aussi de, de réduire la, la mortalité dans, dans nos pays euh, Oui, ce que je voudrais personnellement ajouter, si on veut réussir des résultats dans ce domaine particulier, il faut essayer de renforcer le système de santé dans son ensemble. C'est-à-dire, entre autres, décloisonner les financements qui arrivent dans nos pays. Il faut qu'on sache que pour réduire la mortalité aussi bien des enfants que des femmes et des adultes, il faut qu'on ait un système de santé résilient euh, qui a un financement adéquat et sur lequel on peut faire beaucoup de choses. Si nous partons sur la pneumonie de l'enfant, euh, si des efforts sont faits à la base qui ne sont pas soutenus au niveau district et au niveau tertiaire avec des investissements importants pour l'oxygène et les autres thérapies à ce niveau on se trouvera toujours dans une situation difficile, on n'aurait fait que déplacer le problème nous devons mettre en place un système de santé intégré euh, euh, global qui tienne compte de l'ensemble des problèmes de santé de, de la population. Cela passe obligatoirement par un système de financement pour aller vers la couverture santé universelle. Pour nous, c'est quelque chose qui est indispensable. Le deuxième pilier sur lequel on va insister euh, pour le cas de la Guinée, c'est extrêmement important parce que nous sommes devenus un pays à épidémies multiples, mais aussi simultanées. Au cours de la même année, nous pouvons nous retrouver avec cinq ou six épidémies à la fois, dont la gestion de ces épidémies euh, consomme énormément d'énergie et de ressources. Donc ces deux piliers-là, à notre avis, doivent aller ensemble, euh, mettre un système de surveillance épidémiologique extrêmement important au niveau du pays, mais aussi renforcer le système de santé pour aller vers la couverture santé universelle. La vaccination contre la pneumonie est pour nous un engagement fort et c'est pour cela que nous avons décidé que au courant de l'année 2024, ce vaccin va être introduit avec l'appui des différents partenaires. Mais je voudrais aussi donner ici un élément de plaidoyer fort. Nos pays ont des ressources très limitées et l'introduction de nouveaux vaccins coûte suffisamment d'argent. C'est pour cela que tous les partenaires ici présents devraient comprendre que pour des pays fragiles comme la Guinée, nous voulons aller vite, mais il nous manque des moyens. Et les moyens qui vont être mis à disposition du pays pourront nous aider à sauver le maximum d'enfants 
à travers le pays. Et c'est en ça que j'appelle l'ensemble de nos donateurs ici pour qu'ils tiennent compte de la position de fragilité de nos pays pour qu'on n'ait pas à acheter tous ces vaccins parce qu'on n'a pas les moyens. Je vous remercie. Ok, merci docteur. J'espère que les partenaires présents dans la salle ont entendu le, le cri de cœur de docteur Yansane et que la Guinée sera supportée pour cette activité. Euh, alors, pour euh, résumer un peu cette session, nous avons avec ces trois pays, vu que c'est plus la santé communautaire qui est mise en avant, il faut mettre l'accent sur la santé communautaire euh, dans ses aspects curatifs, promotionnels et préventifs. Euh, ceci, est effectivement, permet de réduire la mortalité, mais j'aimerais quand même rappeler à nos autorités que le niveau communautaire, c'est bien, mais comme l'a dit Monsieur Dr Yansane tout à l'heure, il faut qu'au niveau supérieur, il y ait aussi des capacités, il y ait du matériel pour une prise en charge efficace des complications qui, qui vont arriver. Et dans nos pays, de plus en plus, les hôpitaux sont délaissés au profit de cette santé communautaire. Les deux doivent aller ensemble. Euh, nous avons aussi avec euh, leurs différentes interventions, vu qu'il faut une amélioration globale du système de santé, cela est très très important, avec une intégration des, des activités et pour finir, la couverture universelle, santé universelle, cela a déjà commencé dans, dans les pays et je pense que c'est aussi euh, une stratégie qui permet d'avoir de bons résultats. Mais j'insiste encore auprès de nos autorités, nous voulons des résultats, nous voulons des résultats par rapport à la réduction de cette mortalité. Et il ne faut pas que ça s'arrête dans cette salle, qu'au retour, quand même, nous puissions engager des, des activités qui puissent nous amener à réduire la mortalité infantile. Là, je parle en tant que pédiatre, parce que vraiment, c'est très, très difficile pour nous d'entendre de, de, ces chiffres de, de mortalité. Et je pense que vous pourrez faire en sorte que dans deux ans, quand nous allons revenir, nous serons déjà à 10-15% de baisse annuelle de la mortalité dans notre pays pour que nous soyons au, au rendez-vous. Merci à tous pour euh, avoir assisté à, à ce panel. Je remercie euh, les, les différents intervenants. Merci beaucoup. Merci. So a very warm thank you to both Dr. Kasungami and Dr. Silla and their panelists and for all of the panelists for being very frank about both challenges but strategies to overcome those challenges in different countries. We're now actually going to take a, a short break. The refreshments being served in the foyer. Please, can I ask you all to make your way back here at 11.10, so 10 minutes past 11, so that we can have a prompt start. There's a lot for you to think about and lots of people for you to talk to, so have a very good break. Thank you. Okay, good morning again. If I could ask all of you to take your seats as quickly as possible, we have a really interesting panel um, and a very interesting group of people waiting just backstage to start on the next set of discussions. And just to mention, while we were on the break, one of our colleagues came up to me and said, that while he was finding a lot of the discussions really interesting, he was really waiting to hear about how we made people accountable 
for the new strategies that we're looking at for the way in which we implement the next stages of what's happening. So in deference to him, I can't see where you are in the audience. I'm bringing that up so that accountability continues to be something we're thinking about, even as we discuss different strategies and different ways forward. And so to start us off again in our discussions, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Kike Basat of IS Global in Champs in Mozambique. And his panel will be discussing child health and mortality prevention surveillance. Thank you, Dr. Kike. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome again to Madrid. Uh, I'm so glad to be back in this second global forum of childhood pneumonia and who would have told us in January 2020 all that would be happening in the following three years. At least now there is not a single person in the planet that knows what pneumonia is, so that's an advantage of the pandemic. My name is Kike Basat and I am a pediatrician and a clinical researcher working at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, is global, and also at the Manisa Health Research Center, SISM in Mozambique where I act as the co-principal investigator of the CHAMS project, what we're going to be talking about in this uh, session. And I have the pleasure of introducing three important members of the CHAMS family who will be leading the presentation of this uh, session. First person is Sana, Dr. Sana Matap. She is a co-investigator from CHAMS South Africa. She completed her medical training in Pakistan and holds a master's and a PhD in pediatrics from the University of Cape Town and she has more than 10 years' experience in infectious disease research. Second person is Dr. Ima Abazi Basei. She's the lead pathologist of the Sierra Leone CHAMPS site, where she is responsible for the histopathology component of CHAMPS diagnostics and where she also chairs the site decode panel. She holds a specialist fellowship of the Faculty of, the Patholo of, the Faculty of Pathology of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria and is an associate professor of pathology. And the third person is my good friend, Dr. Nega Asefa, who is a professor of maternal and child health at the Haramaya University in Ethiopia, where he also leads as PI the CHAMS Ethiopian site. So today we're going to be talking about CHAMS, about mortality surveillance uh, in children. And the world sees every year around 5 million under 5 uh, deaths and about nearly 2 million uh, stillbirths. And 80% of those uh, deaths occur in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Unfortunately, our understanding of the detailed causes underlying those deaths remains incomplete. And current estimates are imprecise because they rely on imprecise methodologies, such as, for example, the verbal autopsy. What is CHAMPS? CHAMPS is the Child Health and Mortality Prevention Surveillance Network and is a long-term endeavor set up to comprehensively monitor uh, child mortality and investigate its causes. It is currently in its eighth year of activities and supported by the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, currently operates in seven countries and soon will open in two additional ones. CHAMPS is providing the backbone of future child mortality statistics. And CHAMPS overarching objectives include first to track definitive causes of child mortality in sites throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia using the Minimal Invasive Tissue Sampling, MITS, and second, to produce and disseminate high quality and more reliable than standard data to inform policy and public health action. CHAMPS determines causes of death in children under five using MITS, diagnostic testing, clinical records, and verbal autopsy. And through MITS, post-mortem samples from the key organs and bodily fluids are obtained, which can then be subject to a thorough histopathological and microbiological analysis. Altogether, all available results, demographic, clinical, from the mother and from the child, anthropometric, laboratorial, and verbal autopsy, are then compiled and discussed by the CHAMPS determination of cause of death, the DECODE panel, which is comprised by pediatricians, obstetricians, uh, microbiologists, pathologists, and public health specialists. They all then try to attribute cause of death and describe the causal chain leading to mortality. Everything is coded following an IC, the ICD-10 or ICDPM nomenclature and methodology. And in this session, we aim to discuss the CHAMS results regarding pneumonia, the first number one killer of children uh, in fact, uh, globally. 
So I'll pass the word to Dr. Sana Matab. Yeah. So let me start with a little bit of background. In, nine, in 2022, is around 5 million deaths happened under, fi under 5 uh, age group. And pneumonia has been classified as one of the major uh, cause of the death for post-neonatal deaths, uh, accounting around 14% of the under-5 mortality. So the understanding of the cause of the death is based on very basic, simple, bidimensional approach that one child die because of the one cause of the death, which, however, the level of granularity is not accurate. And uh, the, um, the granularity is not accurate because we are not looking into the complexity and interplay of all the events happening to the mortality. So in this order, we aim for this session to describe the under five mortality uh, due to the pneumonia uh, caused by, uh, and the data collected from CHAMPS, uh, which is the wealth of information using the minimal invasive tissue sampling. So um, just to start with, to summarize this um, uh, figure, uh, is, is summarizing the importance of lower respiratory tract in, uh, tract infection, in, um, whether it's a, a initiator or a, whether it's an initiator or as a, a contributor of mortality. Because um, when we combine everything together, either uh, underlying condition, morbid condition, and intermediate condition, we can see lower respiratory tract infection is the one of the most common cause of the death. But when we are just looking at the underlying cause of the death, it's just cause 10% of the mortality in champs and is on the fifth position. And when we are looking at the intermediate uh, immediate condition, it was on the second one. And when we are looking at the morbid, it's uh, for the most common cause of the death. <laughs> so as um, so we describe, uh, I described already that pneumonia can be the underlying condition and also immediate or antecedent. So it appears from the CHAMPS data is most, more likely that it is the end stage event. So this uh, figure is describing the 10 most common underlying cause of the death when pneumonia is one of the immediate or un, uh, um, antecedent condition. Not surprisingly, malnutrition, HIV, and congenital birth defect are the three most common, uh, common cause facilitating deadly pneumonia. So when we talk about the etiology, uh, so uh, the, we see the JAMS data provide us the granularity of uh, the etiology and the complex and shed the light on the complexity. As we can see, only one third of the pneumonia had, had identified one pathogen, but. 50% of the uh, pneumonia death happened because of the two or more pathogens. That's very important that not one pathogen is causing them. Further, when we look into the further, we saw that the gram negatives are more common as compared to gram positive pathogens. Furthermore, if I'm just going in the namely, Klebs pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumonia, CMV, RSV, and pneumocystis are the more, most common pathogen. In our, in our data. Some of these are more frequently isolated from um, community uh, deaths, while other from the uh, other like health facilities um, being more related to the nosocomial infection. However, a significant number of pneumonia deaths are coming from like Klebsiella, from Klebsiella pneumonia, which is a very significant finding. Let me pass to you. Um, so I'll go to describe what I, I call the CHAMS advantage, which is the robust testing that we do for the CHAMS, you know, um, products, uh, sorry, projects. So CHAMS generates 
quite a huge amount of data that helps us to answer questions that are often difficult to answer um, where pneumonia is concerned. So let's start with the causal chain. We know that um, the cause of death would usually inform intervention. And uh, so we, we don't only want to look at what actually killed the child, the immediate cause of death. We also are able to look at conditions that if they didn't exist, would not cause it. So which condition led to which one, which eventually led to what killed the child. So that's the beauty about um, CHAMS data. We're able to determine what knocked off the child. We're able to say this was the existing condition in the background. And this is what set up the chain of events to, uh, in order for this actual um, um, entity to kill the child. So that's, that's what CHAMS, um, one of the advantages CHAMS brings to the table. Um, we also um, look at things like um, dying from or dying with. Let me go to the next one. So um, like you heard uh, Sana say, sometimes we have multiple pathogens um, you know, um, identified. CHAMS is, um, with the data, using histopathology data, for example, you see um, a positive uh, organism positive in the blood, you see it positive pro uh, probably in the upper airways, but you need to make a statement about whether it contributes to the, the death or to disease in the lungs. We're able to actually say, yes, these, even though we see all of this array of pathogens, this, this, and this is what is responsible for the death. We're also able to determine certain things. For, uh, for example, we have con a lot of countries have the pneumonia vaccines, and yet we see children die. CHAMS data is also able to tell us whether or not the, uh, you know, we're, we're able to identify the serotypes, especially with pneumococcal vaccines, and be able to see if these are the serotypes involved in the vaccines or not. Uh, we're also able to talk about if um, the child is dying with or dying from. You know, we're able to um, identify is what we're seeing, is it an innocent bystander? Or are we seeing something that is the reason why this uh, child has died. I think uh, I've heard uh, from the previous speakers and also so in the first slide, the methodologies of CHAMS. So after rigorous microbiological, pathological and molecular testing, so the question is what? So how many of the cases could be prevented or not. So we have tried to investigate whether there is a possibility of averting those diseases. So we come up with uh, deciding 82% of diseases attributed to pneumonia could have been prevented with various modalities, including uh, you know, management, uh, good clinical management, good health education, uh, good health seeking behavior, uh, increasing coverage of vaccination, and so on. So this has been, you know, the usual uh, decode panelist recommendation. They don't recommend, they don't decide only the cause of death, uh, but also recommend whether this has been prevented or not, and uh, the modalities of uh, prevention. So when it comes to Ethiopia, so we have been, you know, uh, doing various uh, activities related to CHAMS data. So we have been uh, taking the data and the information to families at local level with communities, religious leaders, community gatherings, and so on. Nationally, also, we are sharing data to the Ministry of Health, Ethiopian Public Health Institutes, uh, as to what kinds of intervention be uh, done. Related to pneumonia, you know, some of the organisms are, you know, drug-resistant organisms, and some of them are usually living in the hospital, you know, they are part of uh, normal flora of uh, the hospital. So that kind of information has been communicated to the ministries, Ethiopian Public Health Institutes, and regional health bureaus. Internationally, you know, CHAMS data is actively being shared to you know, WHO, UNICEF, and also IHME in the integration of data with other uh, data sources. So in conclusion, uh, I can uh, note some of the concluding remarks. CHAMS is not only determining the cause of days, and the causative agents, but also you know, the context in which uh, the death uh, occurs. Uh, usually, we used to hear that streptococcus pneumonia causes the death of 
child related to pneumonia, but some of the newest organisms like Clefcilla pneumonia, CMV, and pneumocystis uh, are attributed to the occurrence of days. And in many countries uh, where this chance activity is going on, uh, PCV vaccines are in the routine, but still children are dying of, you know, streptococcus pneumonia. So what is the case? And this has to be, you know, further investigation in order to identify the strengths of the causative agents uh, has to be uh, done. And uh, at local level, I think so far we have been uh, doing a lot of activities and informing the communities, families, and also the local uh, uh, health institutes. Uh, but at national level, apart from sharing data, I think further uh, actions has to be taken. Like I said, close to 56% of the organisms are resistant to uh, antibiotic. This is uh, number one. Number two, you know, in Ethiopia and other African countries, I think PCV vaccine is in the routine, but I'm not sure which valents are uh, being given in the other part of Africa. But in Ethiopia, we are currently providing PCV-10. So there is a possibility to think about uh, whether this uh, has to be upgraded to the other uh, kinds of uh, PCV vaccine so that it would, be, uh, it would cover uh, you know, the other strains. Uh, in fact, it has to be informed by research like uh, the CHAMPS. So uh, this is uh, our own and uh, these are you know, our partners. CHAMPS being uh, operating at uh, Emory, uh, collaborating with CDC, IS Global, and other organizations, WHO and UNICEF being uh, part of uh, our activities. And the respective countries, I think uh, you can see various institutions are you know, part of the CHAMPS activity. In Ethiopia, I think RMI University and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Ethiopian Public Health Institutes are you know, working. And in the other part of uh, the uh, CHAMS sites, I think the local universities and uh, the Minister of Health are, uh, you know, uh, working. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nega. And, I, and of course, we need to thank also the families that accept to participate in a project like as sensitive as, as CHAMS is. Allow me to use the last remaining minutes that we have for a few questions and answers. And the first question I would like to ask to Dr. Sana uh, is, what specifically is CHAMS revealing about pneumonia pathogens? that uh, we didn't know before and what are the implications for vaccination strategies? So I would start with saying like it reveals a lot of things. I have few very limited times so that I will try to highlight few highlights from the CHAM study. Starting with the pathogen, I would say that the first biggest thing is multiple pathogens. 50% of the pneumonia deaths occur because of the multiple pathogen, two or more than pathogens. Namely, if I go individually, Klebsiella is the most sec second most common community-acquired um, uh, pathogen. So it's highlight two things. One is the treatment, the antibiotics we are giving might be not uh, sufficient and advocate, so we have to look into that. The second thing is vaccine. We know that it's the most one of the most common pathogen. What is happening with the vaccine? It's I haven't seen much of the work going on that. So that's one of the basic thing that we are have, I would like to highlight. The second is Staphylococcus pneumonia. We all know that uh, under child, childhood immunization program, we have PCV, but still, as this is the most common pathogen causing the death. So again, highlighting few things. In the failure of the immunization program. The second is Maybe the serotypes are not the one which is included in vaccines. So we have to look for higher valency vaccine, which include more serotypes, and we can try to reduce those step deaths. From the next is viruses. So CMV is the most common virus for our study in CHAMPS, which was not really identified in previous study. Like PERCH just uh, had some few uh, cases of CMV. But we are, as we are uh, doing the histology and microbiology, we really revealed that CMV is most common virus. And it was also, um, the thinking was like, it's more common in the kids who, uh, the children who are living with HIV or have exposure. But in our case, one third of those ones are not living with HIV and not exposed to uh, HIV. So again, my question is about vaccine. What the next, we have to do something. We can 
stop those um, those deaths. Uh, the last I would like to mention the nemocystis, which is the most common fungi uh, in our study, and 60% of them are among the children living with HIV. And, and all those sites have PMTCT. So it's highlighting the failure of PMTC in all the sites. We have to start thinking how we can save all those lives. Thank you very much, Sana. To Dr. Rima, uh, you have talked about the critical difference between dying from and dying with. Um, and could, could you share a story of a finding that surprised you when, when you were assessing the results of the tissue samplings, uh, samples from, from the CHAMP sites? Yeah, one, um, one finding that stands out for me is CMV, you know, that uh, um, Sana just talked about. Um, you know, the, the burden of CMV is becoming more, uh, more obvious. It's important to make the distinction between CMV disease and CMV infection, because we know that infection doesn't always translate to overt disease. You know, so we're often cautious about interpreting the detection of viral antigens or nucleic acid as we, if we see it in body tissue, uh, tissue samples or body fluids, we're cautious about interpreting that as being disease. But then because of the, you know, the wide variety of tissue that we sample, you know, we sample the brain, the lungs, the liver, you know, MP, uh, nasopharyngeal samples, rectal swabs and all of that we're able to pick up a whole bunch of things. And we're noticing that we're not just dealing with infection, but we're actually seeing pathology in the, uh, sorry, in the lungs and even in the liver, but let's talk lungs now, this is pneumonia. So we're seeing a lot of um, um, viral pneumonia that we can attribute to CMV and all, we're able to use ebido histochemistry to actually identify that yes, we're dealing with CMV, we're all seeing viral inclusions and all of that. So that really highlights for me that CMV is probably more, a lot more serious than we think. Great. And, and w without leaving you, because I think it's very important that we get a good view of, from a pathologist, because the big novelty of, of CHAMPS is the introduction of, of post-mortem sampling and, and pathological methods. No? And that's where we get this additional information. Could you share a particular experience that stands out in your mind as, as a pathologist? Uh, yes, um, a, a case of rabies stands out for me. It was in a four-year-old child who presented with um, severe respiratory distress and convulsions and had some um, history of what they call barking behavior. We didn't quite know what that meant at the point at that time. Um, when we looked at it, there was really nothing we could put a, a finger on. The CNS samples didn't show encephalitis. It didn't show anything of viral etiology. We just saw focal microcalcifications and focal intraparenchymal hemorrhages, you know? Um, not too long after that, we got additional clinical information that this child had been beaten by a dog, I think three months prior to that. And um, so we took back, you know, because we take these t-shirts and we sent it back for immuno. And it turned out that they were, the immuno was able to stain for rabies within the neurons, you know. And um, this for us highlighted the value of clinical information when you're interpreting findings. And, you know, it's led to a couple of other things like um, um, we're able to report to the DHMT, where uh, the DSS and, you know, follow up with surveillance. And during the panel seating, we're able to also uh, bring out issues that needed attention, such as uh, dogs, you know, policy on dogs, vaccinations and all of that, um, um, you know, post-exposure treatment and um, just stepping up surveillance. Yeah, that, that stood out for me. Oh, it's a great example. The, the clinical information was the hint, but the confirmation was the immunohistochemistry yes, we applied we to the, to to the brain and tissues. Fantastic. And, and I have a question for, for Nega now. Uh, you work for CHAMPS in Ethiopia, uh, a country that is very close to achieving the child survival SDG. How can the Ethiopian government turn the CHAMPS data into action uh, that would accelerate child mortality declines? Uh, can, can you share some recommendations? Well, uh, I think when we disaggregate Ethiopia's data from the other uh, CHAMP site data, and you know, a significant proportion of these are occurring even in the health facilities, 
children admitted in the hospital for various reasons, like some, or maybe prematurity, or any other problem, are dying of pneumonia and sepsis. So we tried to investigate further, and as said already, Clemsilla pneumonia and Streptococcus pneumonia, which is a drug-resistant kind of organism, uh, is you know killing uh, babies. So the question is why these organisms are drug resistant. You know, Ethiopia. I think uh, we have uh, um, several um, uh, countries bordering us, and the border is porous, and antibiotic smuggling with other contraband materials is uh, you know, common. So I think uh, there must be some kind of uh, activity going on in order to control a pro uh, drug use, antibiotic use, uh, both in the community as well as uh, in the facilities. That is one. Another is, you know, we have tried to screw up at the NICU and pediatric area and grow the organisms in our laboratory. And it appears, you know, 7% of the swabs uh, tend to grow and drug resistant Klebsiella pneumonia and a Streptococcus pneumonia, which implies there is poor IPC. Then uh, the lesson that we have to take is, you know, uh, proper IPC, particularly in the NICU area, pediatric area. Um, and with, you know, available basic materials, improvised materials uh, could be done. So child mortality, you know, can be prevented particularly in the hospitals with proper antibiotic use uh, and also with uh, appropriate uh, IPC practice in the hospitals and health facilities. Fantastic. Thank you, Nega. And I have a last question for any of you, and any of you can respond. Um, CHAMS is a very expensive and, and difficult to maintain, at least in the long term, uh, surveillance uh, exercise or project. And, and it's running thanks to the generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So what lessons have we learned from CHAMS that could be extrapolated for future routine mortality surveillance at the national level? Who volunteers to respond? Nega, go ahead, please. Well, I think uh, CHAMS is doing uh, analysis of sample for the dead bodies. But uh, the purpose behind this is to save lives uh, in the future. So if that's the case, then as said, CHAMS uses advanced technologies and high-level expertise in analyzing cause of death. We cannot put this advanced equipment in every district hospital, in every referral hospital, and so on. And also, experts are not available to interpret the findings. But simpler uh, you know, diagnostic facilities like culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing can be done uh, in many of the hospitals. And the result can be used for improvement of clinical practice. So aspiring for saving more uh, lives in the future, uh, you know, CHAMS uh, information can be extrapolated for the routines uh, with the application of culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing in the improvement of uh, uh, clinical care. Thank you, Nega. Any very quick, super short answer from any of you too? Um, well, um, I'm, th I'm thinking we can build the CHAMS, um, you know, technique into routine surveillance activity instead of making it an independent research activity. I mean, that would require a lot more thought. Um, and then, of course, build capacity, because when you sample that, you have to do the testing. So build capacity for diagnostics, like pathology, for example, in a lot of our CHAM sites is not there. So that would be important. Yeah. yeah. Just to add on that, CHAMS is like very comprehensive. It do a lot of testing. But we can try to come up with a simplified uh, procedure, which can be implemented and sustainable and being like standard of care at not at only on CHAMP sites but overall like lower middle income countries to get information including the um, microbiology and histology to understand the cause of the death and just focus on the main um, pathogens which are more prevalent in that settings. Thank you very much. We need to remember that medical science has evolved thanks to the use of pathology, historically speaking. So we need to go back to that uh, resource and we need to go back uh, to understanding what is actually killing our children. Uh, not only in sentinel sites, and CHAMPS acts very beautifully as, as, as a network of sentinel sites, but also try to extrapolate that to a more nationally uh, applicable system. So this brings this session to an end. And if you allow me, all the organizers of, of uh, the forum, 
uh, and also all the participants of the forum have been asked to make commitments. This is a, a meeting of, of action. So I'm actually going to read uh, Is Global's commitment to the forum. And if you allow me, I will, I will read. Uh, is Global's commitment is to stand firmly in the trenches of science that will end this silent emergency. In a world that has faced the terrible reality of a pneumonia pandemic, we find the disproportion between the magnitude of this challenge for children and the resources invested in it unacceptable. That is why we are committed to continuing doing research into the root causes of childhood pneumonia in low and middle income countries and to making prevention and treatment strategies that combat, combat it a reality. We want to be part of the scientific vanguard that brings the next generation of treatments, diagnostics and vaccines for childhood pneumonia to the world. And we are committed to open research, guiding the efforts of new evidence-based policy recommendations. Our commitment is to do this by joining forces with the friends, colleagues and allies present at this forum, with whom we share one of the noblest aspirations of our time. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to Dr. Kike and the panelists, and thank you to IS Global for that commitment. It's really good to know that we are not just talking, we're not just sharing information, but we're taking this information and looking at how we're going to apply it in our acceleration of our efforts. And so the next panel who will um, be speaking will be looking at identifying the children at greatest risk. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Nantalile Mugala and her panelists to discuss this. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's indeed my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our session, identifying the children at greatest risk, the threats of malnutrition, air pollution, low birth weight, and poor hygiene. As we delve into this topic, it is clear that reducing child mortality from pneumonia is an urgent issue. We heard the statistics this morning that requires immediate attention. The Global Burden of Disease reports that approximately 700,000 children under the age of five die from pneumonia each year. And this was actually heard this morning. This number of deaths is far too many. 370,000 deaths are attributable to wasting, 300,000 to air pollution, 140,000 to low birth weight, and 100,000 to lack of hand washing and soap. We must prioritize strategies to address these issues if we are to reduce the number of children dying from pneumonia. We are fortunate to have this morning five distinguished speakers with us today who have extensive experience in this field. They will provide us with valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities in identifying children at the greatest risk and how we can effectively tackle these issues. Dr. Ngaba, who is the Director, Therapeutic Unit, uh, Hospital de la Mite in Chad. Dr. Taruk, who is the lead revitalizing informal settlements and their environments in Indonesia. Dr. Diola, who is um, at the University, Joseph Kizebo in Burkina Faso. Dr. Gizela, who is the head of Family Health, Ministry of Health in Mozambique. And last, but indeed not the least, mm -hmm. Professor Dauma, who is president and CEO of Somali Research and Development Institute in Somali. These are our distinguished panelists. Now let's start our, our, our session. And um, my first question actually goes to Dr. Gaba. 
Dr. Ngaba, you treated children who were both severely malnourished and ill with infections in a therapeutic nutritional unit in a major hospital in Chad. What can you tell us about how these children came to be so sick? Was there a typical story? Uh, merci, uh, Dr. Mugala. Il uh, n'y a pas une histoire uh, en tant que telle unique, uh, mais en fait, en gros, c'est d'abord la pauvreté. Maintenant, le contexte a évolué. Uh, tout au début, il y avait un problème uh, d'urance. Voilà, et ce problème d'urance, uh, c'est plus uh, basé sur, uh, ne serait-ce que l'alimentation, uh, uh, comment on appelle ça, juste l'alimentation du jeune nourrisson et également de l'enfant en croissance. Maintenant, avec le temps, euh, il faut savoir qu'il y a ce qu'on appelle une avancée du désert qui est en train de frapper le pays. Et cette avancée, fait en sorte, cette avancée du désert fait en sorte que les familles se déplacent vers les régions où la pluviométrie elle est basse, dans les régions où la pluviométrie elle est plus en fait, elle est meilleure, en fait, pour la survie, bien entendu, de la famille et, bien entendu, des tout petits-enfants. Maintenant, euh, non seulement le climat qui affecte également euh, ce contexte, mais nous avons également euh, remarqué qu'il y a les conflits. Eh bien, les conflits, euh, surtout aux environnants, dans les, dans, dans les régions où ces conflits se, se trouvent, ces conflits font en sorte que les les familles se déplacent vers les régions, en fait, les régions susceptibles de ces conflits, où, il y a, où se, se, se trouvent ces conflits, vers les grandes villes, là où il y a plus d'opportunités euh, pour la famille et bien entendu également pour, euh, pour les enfants. Maintenant, euh, le constat, c'est que quand ces familles se déplacent, les familles deviennent vulnérables du fait d'avoir d'abord euh, un loyer, et d'avoir de quoi euh, survivre, en fait. Et donc, c'est de là qu'il y a euh, maintenant l'impact direct sur les enfants de ces familles qui se déplacent. Euh, hormis euh, ces conflits, il y a également un problème de, de planning familial. Des enfants que nous admettons dans l'unité nutritionnelle thérapeutique, ces problèmes de planning familial ont plusieurs volets. Il y a un volet où juste un couple avec bon, une famille avec un mari et, et une femme font plus d'enfants. Et mal, malheureusement, les, les grossesses rapprochées font en sorte que d'abord, hein, la femme qui est euh, déjà malnutrie encore porte une grossesse. Et donc, enfin, on a ce qu'on appelle les enfants qui naissent avec un faible poids de naissance. Et euh, là, c'est une partie. De l'autre partie, nous avons également euh, les tout petits enfants qui doivent avoir plus d'attention. Et euh, tous ces enfants-là, maintenant, vont également vers la malnutrition. En fait. Donc, nous avons de sur quoi de, la grossesse va avoir un faible. On, on aura un enfant, un nouveau-né à faible poids de naissance. Et l'enfant qui est déjà là en train de grandir va aussi avoir euh, tombé dans la malnutrition. En fait. Donc, euh, ce sont ceux-ci. Et maintenant, pour clore, c'est également le moyen même pour euh, accéder au centre euh, de santé, du centre de soins. Parce que déjà, euh, la famille n'a pas assez d'argent pour se prendre en charge. Et donc, quand un enfant tombe malade, du fait qu'ils n'ont même pas de l'argent pour se prendre en charge, eh bien, ils ont du mal à aller vers les centres de, de soins pour effectivement euh, assister cet enfant qui est malade et donc l'enfant peut rester à la maison et puis avec euh, tu vois, ce cycle là comme ça et l'enfant arrive vers le centre nutritionnel euh, l'unité thérapeutique nutritionnelle à un état très grave c'est c'est pour cela que nous recevons des enfants qui sont sévèrement malnutris et donc c'est pour cela que je dis globalement ceci c'est la pauvreté et bien entendu l'éducation que euh, une euh, on, a, on a mentionné ce, ce matin le fait que les mères ne sont pas éduquées affecte d'une manière vraiment très grande euh, tout, ce, tout, ce, tout, ce, ce, tout ce cycle en fait. Merci beaucoup. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Gaba. Um, Dr. Diallo, you have published very important research which shows that many children discharged from the hospital, in fact, die shortly afterwards in several African and Asian settings. What is the role of malnutrition in these deaths? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mugale, uh, for your question, and thank you to the organizer for inviting us here to speak about uh, the CHAIN data. So CHAIN stands for Childhood Acute Illness Nutrition Network. So this was a multicentric uh, study conducted in four African countries, Burkina Faso, Uganda, Kenya, and Malawi, and in two Asian countries, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. And the study was remarkable by its size because uh, we were able to enroll 3,101 children age from two to 23 months. And uh, we were also able to follow those children from admission to six months post discharge. Because you know, most of the time in the current guideline, there is poor follow up of children who have been admitted so we were able to follow over 97% of those children who were discharged alive and to capture uh, the mortality both during hospitalization but also in the post-discharge period. And the most outstanding uh, really findings from this study were that uh, the risk of death, of course, remained high among acutely ill children. It was 11% uh, in average. And uh, this risk was similar, both uh, inpatient and after discharge. It was around 6% for both period. And really to us, the most significant finding was that half of the death actually occurred uh, post-discharge, meaning that uh, those children just got out from hospital to die, which is really uh, something which haven't been very uh, frequently report reported in the literature in such large studies. So uh, half of the death occurred actually in the post-discharge period, and over half of those deaths post-discharge happened at home. That means they didn't come back to the health facilities, and this is another important message and funding. And lastly, uh, those Post-discharge death, uh, over a third of them just happened within a month of uh, hospital discharge, meaning that actually uh, the estimation of child mortality provided, uh, for instance, by the statistics were underestimated because most of those children have died just uh, within a month uh, after the quiet hospital. And of course, we were also able, because of this large data set, to make some modeling using a computer learning method and approach. And we were able to identify uh, what we call uh, risk, mortality risk clusters. And uh, uh, we were able uh, to show that post-discharge mortality was predictable, as is inpatient uh, mortality. And among the strong predictors, of course, of post-discharge death, you have low or very low anthropometric uh, score, uh, and especially those children who have severe wasting and were severely uh, malnourished. Those were the ones who were at highest risk of death during the post-discharge period. They have up to seven times more risk of dying uh, in the post-discharge period compared to those who were not malnourished. So clearly, malnutrition is playing a very big role in occurrence of death of children acutely ill, uh, whatever uh, medical reason uh, brought them uh, for admission. And this was true both for children presenting with moderate acute malnutrition, but more even for those presenting, presenting with severe acute uh, malnutrition. And among the, the predictors, we also need to underline the role of the other socioeconomic uh, predictors, you know, in relation to the mother, mental health, health status, 
but also uh, access to health, uh, to health facilities and also uh, probably uh, some of the lab uh, features uh, that we were able to identify a biological marker of death uh, for children with acute illness and who are uh, severely uh, malnourished. Thank you very much, Dr. Diallo. Obviously, very, very worrying if we have such a big proportion of children dying in the homes post-discharge, which really underlies, under, you know, um, of, emphasizes the fact that even our statistics may not be accurate. And we also know that a lot of these malnourished children are actually very prone to diseases such as pneumonia, so definitely very worrying there. I'll turn to you, Dr. Tarouk. Yeah. So you are leading a new trial to see how WASH investments might improve child health in 12 informal settlements in Indonesia, and you've already conducted a baseline data. What have you learned about the risks children face in these communities? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mughal, for the question. Um, so I think there are two main things that we have learned from our baseline data that we want to share with the audience today. So first is the environmental condition uh, to which children are exposed to. Um, so these settlements are mostly located in a flat, low-lying topography uh, with uh, little and sometimes no proper drainage uh, around the neighborhood. So this caused some prolonged ponding and sometimes prolonged flooding, especially during the wet season where after heavy rainfall. Um, so we have 50% or half the uh, household that is part of our study reporting flooding outside or around their house. And then 30% of uh, the whole household uh, is reporting water entering the house uh, during wet season and especially after uh, uh, consecutive uh, heavy rainfall um, in, in the area. And regarding to sanitation, so toilets uh, in these informal settlements are not connected to safely managed sanitation or uh, wastewater treatment system. So most of the toilets uh, in the houses in informal settlements that we studied uh, are connected to individual septic tank, uh, which are not properly constructed, um, it has no base. So um, with the densely populated informal settlement, so these septic tanks are frequently located near shallow wells where residents in the community use water from that shallow wells as a, as a water source for cleaning, for, for showering, and also for washing. So we can see that children living in these informal settlement settings are uh, exposed to environment with a uh, high risk of fecal uh, contamination and pathogen exposure. Um, so in RISE, since we're studying, we're doing a, a WASH intervention. So we're, we're focusing mostly on diarrhea and enteric dysfunction as our primary health outcome that we're trialing. Um, but studies have shown that diarrhea is uh, associated with an increased risk of subsequent, subsequent pneumonia infection. So I think there is an interrelation uh, to those, to those um, disease. Um, and the second thing is I want to share some of the results of our uh, children health survey that we conducted as part of our, our ba baseline data collection. Um, so, so these are data from children under five that are living in those 12 informal settlements. Um, and this is uh, reported by their caregiver. So. Uh, we have 20% of caregiver reporting poor general health of their children uh, within the, the last seven days. Um, and with regard to symptoms, 30, 34% uh, are reporting uh, coughing, which could be an indication of uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory illness mm -hmm. also within the past seven days. Uh, and then 27% are reporting uh, a fever in, in their children. And then we have 10% of children experiencing diarrhea. And then we have we found that 27% children are anemic in various degrees. Uh, and with regards to nutrition, 44% uh, of the children are uh, experiencing stunting, uh, and 41% children are experiencing uh, being underweight. So these numbers that we found in this informal settlements are are higher than the average number that if we compare that with the national average and also with the provincial um, average. Um, so we can see that from this, from this results that children 
who are living in informal settlements are at greater risk of, of infection. So they are, they are more exposed to pathogens mm -hmm. and their body is also less immune to, to, those, to those pathogens. Thank you very much um, for sharing those um, very important results um, from your study. I now turn to you, um, Dr. Gisela. So babies born with low birth weight are extremely vulnerable to death from pneumonia and other causes. What is the Mozambique Ministry of Health doing to support women so that they may have healthy pregnancies and healthy outcomes in terms of you know, baby weight and, and general well-being? Thank you. I will speak in Portuguese. Uh, dizer que Moçambique tem cerca de 40% das adolescentes dos 15 aos 19 anos já numa união. É um dos desafios. Temos alta prevalência de gravidez na adolescência. De acordo com o um inquérito realizado em 2015, temos cerca de 46% de crianças, de adolescentes já grávidas. E apesar da desnutrição crónica ter reduzido de 43% para 38%, ela ainda é considerada alta. Temos estratégias em curso com o Ministério, com o Ministério da Saúde, dentre as quais a implementação da legislação referente à criminalização do, das uniões prematuras e que visam o desencorajamento das mesmas a implementação da Estratégia Nacional de Adolescentes e Jovens, Saúde Escolar e dos Adolescentes, que, dentre várias ações, tem também a prevenção da gravidez na adolescência e a implementação do Plano Nacional de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional, que tem os seus, as suas metas até 2030, e a redução, dentre as quais a redução da desnutrição de 38% até 20%, até 30%. Outras ações em curso são uh, garantir que as mulheres tenham acesso aos cuidados pré-natais de qualidade e de forma ótima, não é? O início de precoce das consultas pré-natais, antes das 12 semanas, e a cobertura de pelo menos quatro consultas pré-natais. No inquérito realizado em 2015 sobre indicadores de malária e HIV, tínhamos 55% das mulheres que começavam precocemente os cuidados pré-natais. E não só, temos outras ações para adesão ao parto assistido por pessoal qualificado. Temos também a oferta de cuidados completos focados nas principais causas de mortalidade. O rastreio, a desnutri... rastreio e a prevenção da desnutrição materna, suplementação com ferro, e ácido fólico, o tratamento preventivo da malária, com fanzidar, e a distribuição universal de redes mosquiteiras, para além de detecção e, e tratamento atempado das infecções de transmissão sexual, que é oferecido à mulher e ao seu parceiro, diagnóstico precoce dos fat outros fatores de risco para a gravidez, como a diabetes e a hipertensão, e rumo ao plano também despiste precoce das infecções de transmissão sexual, para cumprimento pleno da, do plano da tripla eliminação, que é o HIV, sífilis e a hepatite B. Okay. Além disso, temos também algumas recomendações que estão no nosso Ever Newborn Action Plan, que é o tratamento, uh, o tratamento com dexametasona, para aquelas mulheres que têm risco de ter um, um parto pré-termo, e implementamos também outras estratégias, que é o envolvimento masculino em todos os contatos da saúde materno-infantil, desde a consulta pré-natal, na maternidade, a oferta de, de, de testagem, encaminhamento para o tratamento antirretroviral, em caso de, ser, de serem seropositivos, o envolvimento masculino também no planeamento familiar, para que elas possam, de fato, passar as gravidezes. Também estamos a fazer o fortalecimento da capacidade técnica dos uhum. trabalhadores e dos provedores de saúde 
para que eles possam fazer a provisão de serviços e referência atempada para o um nível mais alto de referência em caso de necessidade. Estamos a reforçar as brigadas móveis, não é? incluindo o atendimento pré-natal, face às emergências que temos tido e também a reforçar o, a, as ações ligadas aos compromissos que Moçambique assumiu a nível global para o atendimento na área do planeamento familiar, o, o, o Family Planning 2030, para que as gravidezes elas possam, de fato, ter a possibilidade de espaçar as gravidezes. Eu, muito obrigada. Thank you very much, Dr. Gisela. Again, absolutely impressive. It's good to hear about all those very important preventive interventions that your, your, your Ministry of Health is actually engaging in. Coming to you, Professor Dauma, um, you recently conducted a survey of families in three Somali cities and uncovered many zero-dose children who had never been vaccinated. What did you learn about these children and most importantly, their mother's level of education? Thank you so much, Anna. I thank uh, uh, the organizers of the conference for allowing us to share our experiences uh, with you and, and lessons learned so that we improve on our uh, competencies to prevent childhood pneumonia and also uh, unnecessary deaths of children. So as you stated, we recently conducted an assessment of immunization coverage in three big cities in Somalia, Mogadishu, uh, the capital city where our institute is based, and two other cities, Bosaso and Argesa, which are also two large cities. And we used uh, mixed method uh, methodologies, both quantitative uh, assessment of uh, immunization coverage and factors associated with it, but also qualitative studies to look at uh, uh, the community perception and staff perception from demand side, but also from a supply side on uh, challenges related to immunization coverage. Mm -hmm. And our study was conducted by our institute, uh, SORDI, with uh, ethical approval from the Minister of Health and technical support from International Rescue Committee and funding from Gavi Alliance. And uh, we cover, uh, actually, our results show that the prevalence of uh, coverage of immunization was very low. It was actually between 50 to 60 percent of children that uh, had full immunization. And two major factors that were associated with full coverage were the mother's education. Uh, if uh, the mother was educated up to secondary level, uh, their children were almost 80 percent uh, fully covered. So mother education, especially at secondary level was very strong and significant factor in uh, complete immunization of children and also antenatal clinic mm -hmm. visits were another contributing factor of this full immunization. On our qualitative study, we actually surveyed the staff at these health centers. We surveyed, we, we have in Somalia a large internal displaced persons that have migrated from their original uh, living places due to either conflict or climate factors, either famine or drought or, or flooding to big cities. And they are camped in what we call IDB camps. Mm -hmm. We also surveyed healthy staff, community leaders, and uh, our quality survey discovered that the staff at the health centers uh, lacked sometimes uh, motivations they had a monthly outreach uh, uh, surveys, but they never targeted IDB camps. So they went to villages and uh, the supply side sometimes had issue, although Somalia has really uh, used solar uh, energy to really uh, power the cold chains and that has been improved, but there are out outages sometimes. So from the demand side, both of the availability of vaccines at, at some times, but also staff motivation and training uh, was uh, not up to maximum. From the demand side, uh, we know that the IDB communities never had a targeted uh, vaccine campaigns. Uh, 
most vaccines were uh, given in health facilities, mm -hmm. mostly public health facilities. And Somali, because of uh, protracted uh, uh, civil war and fragile government institutions, the private sector doesn't really give uh, immunization. So that was also lacking. Mm -hmm. And outreach also had very limited coverage. So most vaccines were available only in health facilities. So that was a challenge for IDB uh, communities. And the electronic use is there. We use what we call district health information system. But at district level or at health center level, they didn't use that to really generate evidence for decision making. And uh, the falteries uh, were traced and uh, really not vigorously. Although some health centers had uh, mobile communications and mobile penetration in Somalia is very high, but we uh, discovered that that was not really used uh, optimally. And uh, there are also cultural barriers uh, for some communities to use uh, vaccinations. So we actually learned that there is a lot to improve in terms of community engagement mm -hmm. and going forward. And, uh, really dealing with these misconceptions from communities in terms of vaccinations and involving the community leaders mm -hmm. in the future campaigns. Mm -hmm. And most vaccinations are concentrated on the health sector, but we discovered that there is a need for intersectorial uh, collaboration beyond health sector mm -hmm. in terms of education, women empowerment, mm -hmm. so that the vaccination goes beyond health service delivery mm -hmm. to community engagement and community development initiatives that are going already in Somalia. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Definitely really important lessons there. Um, intersectoral collaboration, um, engagement of leaders at all levels, yeah, community level, very, very important. So thanks for sharing um, that perspective, um, Professor Dauma. I'll get back to you, um, Dr. Gamba, and um, going back to the issue of malnutrition, because you know we all know really malnutrition is such a key, you know, factor in 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 predisposing children to um, life-threatening illnesses such as pneumonia, and so your research concluded that there were cultural attitudes around child feeding by parents um, and especially mothers that contributed to child uh, malnutrition. Can you explain further about these cultural um, you know, attitudes? Um, and the, are there any ways that you think that these can actually be changed, it's those negative cultural attitudes? Oui, uh, merci uh, de m'avoir donné la parole. En fait, uh, nous pouvons parler de... Il y a les attitudes et puis il y a aussi ce qu'on appelle uh, les tabous. Eh bien, euh, ces attitudes, euh, nous avons euh, le plus souvent les, les enfants se font, les, les parents font ce qu'on appelle les scarifications, euh, le plus souvent au niveau de l'abdomen des enfants, soit disant que euh, le sang n'est pas un bon sang, et c'est qui se surinfecte, et le cycle vient en sorte que les enfants finissent dans l'unité nutritionnelle thérapeutique. Euh, avec une complication sur leur malnutrition qui était déjà euh, installée. Euh, nous avons également euh, ce qu'on appelle l'uvulectomie, l'ablation euh, de la luette, qui se fait euh, chez les enfants lorsque l'enfant vomit. Donc l'idée qui est derrière cela, c'est que euh, l'enfant n'arrive pas à avaler, c'est pour ça que l'enfant vomit. Nous avons également ce qu'on appelle euh, l'abulsion dentaire, euh, qui se font euh, juste parce que l'enfant a une anorexie et on fait une abulsion dentaire. Tout ceci se complique, bien entendu, d'une complication d'accord déjà sur un enfant qui est déjà malnutri, et puis les enfants se retrouvent dans l'unité nutritionnelle thérapeutique, dans nos centres. Et, bien, et, et aussi, il y a ce qu'on appelle euh, les, tabous, les tabous. Nous avons les tabous alimentaires, les tabous alimentaires sur des idées qui ne sont pas scientifiquement euh, basées. C est, c est, ces tabous... D'abord, vient euh, du fait qu'il y a certaines familles qui, euh, pour une raison ou pour une autre, se disent que le lait maternel n'est pas bon. Vous savez, deux fois, ils font ce qu'ils font. Ils mettent une fourmi dans du lait maternel. Et puis, si ces fourmis, bien entendu, se noient et meurent, on dit que 
ce lait maternel peut euh, tuer cet enfant. Et donc, euh, ça, ceci maintenant va occasionner ce qu'on appelle un sévrage brutal de ce petit enfant. Nous avons également, euh, du fait, que, du fait du nutritionnel, il y a ce qu'on appelle les œufs. Les œufs, euh, il y a une idée euh, derrière certaines familles comme quoi euh, les œufs peuvent rendre un enfant sourd ou bien les œufs peuvent retarder ce qu'on appelle la locution. Donc ça veut dire qu'on euh, coupe l'enfant de, de manger ce qu'on appelle euh, tout produit euh, en fait, qui contient de, de, des œufs. Nous avons également, euh, on, prenne, on peut prendre par exemple euh, du poulet. Eh bien, ils se disent que si l'enfant mange le poulet, l'enfant aura du mal à euh, marcher. Et donc, euh, on, on empêche l'enfant de euh, manger le poulet. Euh, nous avons là tout autre, euh, par exemple le fruit, le, le, le fruit euh, on accuse le fruit comme quoi le fruit est à la base de euh, la diarrhée des enfants. Le jus de fruit cause euh, euh, des infections respiratoires. Eh bien, euh, ça ce sont euh, dans la recherche que euh, nous avons y amené, ce sont des attitudes et des tabous que nous avons pu euh, euh, déceler. Et bien entendu, euh, il faudrait... Euh, vraiment marteler sur ce qu'on appelle l'éducation des mères et la sensibilisation des mères euh, sur ces euh, attitudes et bien entendu ces tabous. Voilà, euh, oui, et maintenant, euh, les enfants en croissance, il faudrait également éduquer les mères à, sur ce qu'on appelle la bouillie enrichie. Comment faire de la bouillie enrichie, diversifier cela pour aider les enfants en croissance. Donc, euh, euh, ceux-là, D'après la recherche que nous avons menée, nous pensons que ces éléments sont des éléments très, très, très importants qu'il va falloir se focaliser à propos. Il y a également, je pense que l'ONG Alerte Santé a initié un programme de mobilisation, donc de sensibilisation des, des mères, d'accord, pour les éduquer à propos de toutes ces attitudes et de ces, de ces tabous. Et bien entendu, je, nous pensons que tout va vraiment se concentrer euh, sur ce fait-là pour éduquer, à, à, afin qu'on essaie de prévoir au lieu de, euh, de se retrouver toujours à seulement traiter la malnutrition. Donc prévenir euh, mieux que guérir euh, serait l'idéal. Merci. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that insight and hopefully that the the men are also involved because I think some of those cultural attitudes are also perpetuated by the men. But uh, thank you very much for sharing. Dr. Tarouk, um, there are many countries um, here today with very large populations of children that actually are raised in informal settlements. So um, all over across Africa, you know, and I can imagine not just in, in Indonesia, So do you think that the results um, from your studies, who also, from your study, will also be relevant to these other countries? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mugala. Um, so we're really hoping that the research trial that we're doing will be able to provide evidence that um, the WASH intervention that we're building in, in these informal settlements can improve the health of the people living in it, especially for children under five who are more prone to diarrhea, more prone to infection. Mm -hmm. um, so if we are able to show that it works, what we're really hoping is that policymaker will uh, adapt this approach um, to be applied to informal settlements in, in, their, in their countries. Um, so one of the reason is, um, so if it, it can be really challenging to, um, to hope or to provide a conventional centralized uh, wastewater treatment or sanitation system to these informal settlements. So, for example, in Indonesia, even in the big cities, um, not the the system is only connected to a small fraction of the population of the city. And as an example, in Makassar, where we're conduct we're conducting this study, the city has just started building this um, centralized system. And once it's finished, it can only serve about less than 10% of the whole population of the city. So it will be really challenging if we're hoping 
to or to wait until um, these systems are connected to the inf informal settlements. Um, so the the um, wash system, the wash intervention that we're we're using in uh, Rice is a modular system, so it can be tailored uh, or adjusted based on the specific condition of each informal settlement. Uh, and we are also trying to build or design the system together with the communities who are living in it. So we don't want to come build something um, and then go. So we want we want them to have some ownership of the system. Um, so that can ensure also sustainability after the pro the program um, ends. Um, so if we if we if we look at the the six settlements that are currently receiving the intervention in Rice, each of the settlements has really different designs. So the main component of the systems are the same, but the design really uh, tailored to the condition of specific uh, settlements. Um, so yeah. So and then um, we're hoping that. Um, this approach can be an alternative solution uh, to improve the water uh, sanitation and hygiene condition in these informal settlements in any countries. Um, and by doing so, uh, we're hoping to reduce the health risk uh, posed by uh, fecal uh, contamination exposure and other pathogen exposure, especially for children. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Diallo, um, I'm coming back I'll go back to what you shared earlier on, because it's it's really very important that we try to look at um, what are those interventions that will allow us not to have children discharged from the hospital and then dying in the community. So please, can you tell us what, in your opinion, you think hospitals, but I would go further actually and say, what do you think the health systems can actually do better to prevent discharging malnourished children who do not recover but then go on to die in the community. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mugale. I, I want to emphasize uh, two points before really giving some interventions because, you know, uh, children whose family left hospital against medical advice mm -hmm. were also particularly at high risk of death in discharge period. They were at 30% risk mortality in the post-discharge period. And another point I want to emphasize is no WHO IMCI syndromic approach was among the 25 first and strong predictors of post-discharge mortality. This means we can question the relevance of the current guideline in addressing those post-discharge death. So now uh, to come back to, to your main question, I think uh, there, there are probably some things to do about uh, you know, prevention of those death. And those can be split into during admission, what to do to prevent those, and maybe uh, what to do after hospital discharge. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we think is that uh, probably we may need uh, really to, to revise the current guidelines to address uh, those post-discharge death. And this uh, can be done like, you know, through uh, risk stratification upon admission because our data show clearly that you have very high risk group children and very low risk group children. That's mean from admission, uh, pediatrician and other health staff mm -hmm. should be able to identify those children at very low risk so that they can get quick care, get discharged early, and they can focus rather on the children at very high risk of death, both focusing on them for better quality of care, but also using most human resources and other resources to, to, to allocate those children because those are the ones who are really at very high risk of death. So uh, risk stratification using overall predictors is one strategy to think about. And we also think that uh, although uh, the implementation of the current guideline was found to be good in our data, mm -hmm. we can uh, still advise that uh, a checklist before discharge should be implemented that can even capture again those children at very high risk mm -hmm. uh, post-discharge. 
Because, you know, uh, we can question ourselves about why is it so that they were discharged? Maybe uh, the current checklist was not either implemented or is not very suitable. So we can think about a tool like this to be incorporated and to be uh, implemented. We also think that we can train family members when they are still in hospital, especially the mother and all the caregiver, to identify danger sign mm -hmm. back home so that they can reconnect with the health system. Because as we said, uh, half of the death occurred post-discharge, but they didn't even come back to the health facilities. Over half of them died at home. So this brings me to talk about the need uh, to find strategies to reconnect with the health system to improve access and readiness to health facilities for those children who have been recently hospitalized and discharged. Thank you. Thank you very much. Extremely important points raised there. Dr. Gisela, what are some of the most effective ways to prevent low birth weight, babies from infection, and um, how is the government of Mozambique implementing this? I think you did share uh, from the perspective of the mother. So anything else that you'd like to add um, on what you shared earlier on? Thank Any additional insights that you'd like to share? Thank you. Uh, Moçambique está definiu as suas abordagens de acordo com aquilo que são as recomendações internacionais e faz as suas adaptações de acordo com o contexto local. Nós estamos a implementar como país a prevenção e controle de infecções há mais de 10 anos e com os seus diferentes ciclos de melhoria de qualidade. Temos também como uma das estratégias assegurar um parto limpo e feito por pessoal devidamente treinado. As nossas, a nossa taxa de partos institucionais em 2011, no inquérito demográfico de saúde, era de 70%. Mas aqueles que são os nossos dados de rotina de, do, nosso, do nosso sistema de monitoria e avaliação, já estamos em 92% em 2022. Estamos a implementar as precauções universais de, de higiene para reduzir o risco de infecções, como, por exemplo, a lavagem das mãos, a desinfecção, a esterilização do material, não só para o parto, como também para outros procedimentos, e redução da manipulação da parturiente durante o trabalho de parto. Também o uso de antibióticos profiláticos em caso de ruptura prematura de membranas, que é uma recomendação já universal. Temos a nível dos cuidados essenciais ao recém-nascido, os cuidados com o coto umbilical. Moçambique adotou desde 2015 o uso de clorexidina gel para o coto umbilical, sabido que é uma das portas de entrada para muitos germes que causam infecções, principalmente em recém-nascido de baixo, de baixo peso. O nosso país implementa o método de mãe canguru desde 1994, e fomos fazendo atualizações de acordo com as novas recomendações da Organização Mundial de Saúde. E também padronizamos os cuidados pós-natais desde 2011. Aquilo que são as recomendações da OMS, né? o, os cuidados pré-natais essenciais nas primeiras 72 horas após o parto. Temos também uma estratégia de formação do nosso pessoal de saúde, principalmente as enfermeiras de saúde materna e infantil, e com mentorias regulares, não é? O país é vasto, temos cerca de 1.800 unidades sanitárias, então criamos capacidade não só de formação, como também a mentoria pós-formação para que as ações de qualidade sejam daquilo que são os padrões e com uma melhoria constante. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much for that additional insight. Um, again, extremely important. My last question goes to you, Professor Dauma. Um, you have talked about the physical isolation of displaced populations from healthcare as a major risk factor for death. How can health services be brought close to the most vulnerable people rather than building services that they are expected to come to? Thank you so much. And uh, if you just go back to this morning's 
uh, presentation is you, you could have seen that Somali was part of the red zone flag where uh, child mortality is really high and is expected to be higher even in 2030. And really to, to achieve these sustainable development goals targets in Somalia, we need multi-stakeholder interventions from international partners, from the Somali government, but also from the Somali communities. And we can look at, at this uh, health service package to reduce from two sides. One side is the demand side, how to really increase the availability of vaccines, of health facilities, of healthy staff, training them, having strategies and policies, which uh, we think is, is easier to get. The other side, which is how to generate demand, how to engage with the community, how to reach the communities that are even harder to reach, like IDBs. Somalia has around 2 million IDBs who are uh, internally displaced persons in camps. And we have around 2 million others who are out of reach, actually. They are not in uh, government-controlled areas. So any no services actually reaching them. And we have around 500,000 zero doses of, of Somalia. So there is no one solution that fits all. But uh, our, our research has found that we need really to innovate. We need to use community health workers. Mm -hmm. And we have even coined what we call access negotiators. These are community members led by the community leaders. And we had negotiations with them. And they actually facilitated access of our community health workers in hard to reach areas, in IDBs. And these IDBs are also marginalized because they are living with host communities. Uh, they may not speak the local dialect there, so they are more vulnerable. So we, we really need to come up with different solutions. There are opportunities that we can really uh, uh, benefit. One of them is high penetration of mobile uh, communication in Somalia. Around 93% of Somalis have access to mobile communication and, and mobile financing. So I think that's one area where uh, mobile health, mm -hmm. which is already there, can be used to accelerate demand for vaccines mm -hmm. and uptake for it. But mother education, social determinants of health, which is beyond health like education, uh, gender equality, human rights, and uh, targeting vulnerable communities are mm -hmm. other issues that we really need to tackle. And also generating evidence with a local context mm -hmm. that really monitors programs and uh, makes uh, life decisions and action-based learnings to get uh, the benefit from these fundings that are available uh, to, to the Somali people. Mm -hmm. But also overall, the overarching, I think, sustainable development goals is for the Somali people and Somali government also to take charge and responsibility and also to work together so that uh, we can stand uh, again and, and really get where we are before the civil war starts in Somalia. Thank, thank you, you very much, Professor Dama. And with that, um, I'd like to thank all of our distinguished speakers for sharing your invaluable perspectives and experiences. Um, your contributions have actually shed light on the critical issue of reducing pneumonia-related child deaths and illness by addressing malnutrition, air pollution, low birth weight, and poor hygiene. Our discussion today has shown that addressing these risk factors requires a multi-sectoral approach. And we heard from an earlier speaker in the morning about the need to have intersectoral collaboration, but not just collaboration, but as well as accountability. Other sectors such as agriculture, energy, housing, and education must be involved to make sure that children not only survive, but also thrive and grow healthier. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, our audience for your participation in this session. Um, let us take the lessons and recommendations made in this session to work together to create a future in which all children have access to the resources they require to live healthy and thriving lives free of pneumonia. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we go this way. This way? Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much to Dr. Mugala and her panelists. And I'm sure you're all very, very ready for a proper break now. 
Um, we've actually got some choices for you this lunchtime. The first of all is to let you know that lunch will be available in the foyer outside for everyone. Um, the, the most important announcement. Secondly, and this I hope will be of interest to many of you, there is an opportunity to attend a lunch and learn session. And that session is actually going to be looking at empowered mothers and child survival. And we have four really interesting speakers who have information coming from different sectors around that issue. If you'd like to join the lunch and learn session, please collect your lunch from the foyer and go to room Aula One, which is just to the back of that session. There are people at the doors who can guide you. Okay, so lunch and learn, collect your lunch, go to Aula One. And then finally, there's a small group of people who are doing um, a lunch on PCV introduction. They know who they are, they, there's a very small specific group, and we ask them to go to the fourth floor. Okay, so please everybody have a really good lunch. Please come back at five minutes to two, okay? Five minutes to two so we can have a prompt start. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you.